Good morning, everybody. Everybody is seated. Thank you very much. So we're going to start this second day of our ESPEN seminar uh, with a series of uh, workshops. So we are here for the people who are looking, looking at us uh, on Facebook or, or YouTube in the, in the workshop uh, about circular economy. Uh, I'm Nicolas Rossignol from, from ESPEN. Uh, first, I want to apologize because my, my voice is quite broken. <laughs> I kind of lost it uh, yesterday somewhere in Helsinki. I'm not sure that I will be able to recover totally <laughs> before the end of uh, this workshop. But um, uh, there is a good news uh, for you and for me. So that I, I will not speak too much uh, because I, I will not be um, alone uh, this morning. Uh, as you noticed, uh, yesterday we... Uh, Espen decided to uh, uh, engage more actively and more concretely with uh, uh, the medias for this seminar. We are journalists at the plenary session and at the debate also yesterday morning. Uh, we are journalists also uh, at the different workshops in the, in the afternoon and it will also be the case this morning. Uh, so I'm happy to, to, to be accompanied today will be with by Caroline, Caroline Garcia, this Caroline. So Caroline, she's a journalist. She's working for um, the French newspaper and online magazine, La Gazette des Communes, uh, which is, how can I say that, probably the most read and famous uh, newspaper aiming at targeting local policymakers, elect, elect politicians at local level. And in a country which counts more than 35,000 municipalities, and I'm not even mentioning regions, departments, and all other levels and bodies of uh, public authorities uh, in the country, it's, it's quite uh, uh, a huge audience they, they, they have. Uh, so she will be there and will be there together to, um, to, to try to, um, to ask her questions to, uh, and to dis engage the discussion with our, our panelists, and we also count on your support to, to do so with us uh, uh, afterwards. So uh, today and this morning, the discussion will be about circular economy, but we wanted to do it in a specific way. Uh, the overall purposes of uh, these workshops we have this morning is about is thinking and discussing about the specific relationships uh, between the urban agenda partnerships, the different partnerships, and, uh, and ESPEN for the last years, and also trying to uh, launch a discussion about the future of uh, these, uh, these relations and how um, during the next programming period, ESPEN will be able to go on uh, further supporting the, the urban agenda implementation. So we um, are going to, um, to have today uh, with us uh, four, four, four panelists. I'm going to show you what's coming up this morning and, 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 and our agenda. Uh, to start, we, we need to have, a, to have a big picture. And for that, the, the, the most suitable person to do so, and we're really happy to welcome him today, is uh, Yana Kopost, and he will present us here on behalf of the Partnership on Circular Economy, and uh, uh, how the, 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 the partnership uh, built and designed its own strategy and action plans, and, and the way he consider uh, and the way they work together with us uh, uh, over the last years. Then we will also um, present you the, um, the results of two major ESPEN projects that were precisely implemented in the framework of this partnership. Namely, the first one is a big applied research called uh, Circular Economy and its Territorial Consequences, and it will be presented by Carlos, which is, who is here with us today. And uh, the second one will be a targeted analysis, which is a more recent project about combining sharing economy and circular economy that will be presented by Lucas, who is here also in the first row. And we wanted also to have a, another perspective and kind of testimonials, and that's why we are also really happy to welcome with us Janja Kreitmeier mackenzie from the Slovenian Ministry uh, of Environment and Splashal Planning, uh, and she's here to explain us also how Slovenia is setting up uh, new governance models and partnerships uh, and how they built on uh, all these uh, um, on circular economy partnership outcomes. So please let me introduce you at first uh, uh, Yanarko. I've taken a couple of, of notes of to, to introduce you Yanarko because it's quite important. Um, he's been working for um, the city administration of The Hague uh, for quite a long time, for 30 years. Uh, we were active in 
environment, urban development, and spatial planning. And that's many, many fields that we, we like here at Espen, but um, obviously you know that it's not sufficient to be invited at the Espen Seminar. So also you are here because you held the position for over 15 years of uh, um, European um, Affairs Officer uh, for the NAG. And uh, you built um, like the European network of regional, national, and European authorities. And you're, for example, representative uh, for the city of Denag in the circles of the Euro cities at some point. And uh, over the last uh, the, the last years, you moved to uh, something that is qu quite uh, uh, also new, even for Denag, even if Denag is one of the pioneers on this field, which is the the, the policy area of wage ma waste management and circular economy. And you are developing currently for 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 the city its strategies for the transition to urban resource management. And we are really, really happy to, to welcome you today to, uh, to explain uh, to us uh, how you um, participate in the, the design and the implementation of the, of the Urban Agenda Partnership on Circular Economy Strategies and Action Plans. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction, Nicola. Um, that's quite quite a lot I did in 30 years, I think, yeah. Uh, I have a bit of the same problem as Nikolai has with, 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 my, with my voice. Uh, I think everyone is a bit under the weather at the moment, but I will try and do my best and, uh, and, and run you through my, uh, my presentation. Um, I, I would like to take you on a bit of a short adventure um, in, in, in three uh, sections, uh, so to speak. First of all, I would like to tell you something about how this uh, Urban Agenda Partnership on Circular Economy uh, came about and how it is functioning. I don't think that everyone uh, is, 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 uh, is knowledgeable about that. Um, then the second, uh, s the second one I would, I would like to um, go into the action plan of, uh, of the Circular Economy Partnership and then as a third uh, section I would like to go into uh, the collaborative economy or the sharing economy as we uh, as we call it and which is the subject of the targeted analysis uh, process that we're into and on which uh, The Hague is also uh, the lead uh, stakeholder. So first the urban agenda partnership. Um, why an urban agenda partnership? Uh, it was established in 2016 under the Dutch presidency and uh, the, uh, the, the, the Dutch presidency, the presidency was very eager to have a European uh, uh, urban agenda as a sort of complement for the national urban agenda that we had. Um, the urban agenda was established in the so-called Pact of Amsterdam uh, and um, that recognized the importance of cities in the European landscape because of a majority of, of more than 70% of EU citizens live, live in cities and generating over 85% of the EU GDP, which, uh, which is uh, quite a lot. Uh, and in addition, EU legislation uh, is implemented by cities and always, almost always have, has an urban dimension. So this makes cities important um, partners in implementing EU policies ranging from climate change and energy transition to air quality, mobility, digital transition, and of course, circular economy. Um, so an urban agenda for the EU um, in which commission, member states, cities, and other stakeholders work together to, uh, to, to improve the practice of EU policies on the ground is the sensible thing to have. And being a member of uh, the Urban Agenda Partnership on Circular Economy, I would like to take you on a small tour of it. Uh, first of all, who are the partners in this, uh, in this uh, partnership? Uh, we have four groups of partners, the Urban Authorities, European Commission, Member States and Stakeholder Organisations. Um, it is very, uh, very, very, very nice to see that uh, our host country today, Finland, is one of the partners, as is Slovenia, uh, as we, and, and uh, uh, Janja is here, so she will speak later and she will bring in all the member state angles uh, into the debate as I will try to bring the, the urban angle into the debate. Um, what is interesting also is that we had a very, very good involvement of the European Commission in this whole process, especially from DG Regio and DG Environment, um, which are very much uh, very valued partners. And for example, DG Regio was, one, uh, was the one who brought us into contact with ASPON to do a targeted analysis on the 
collaborative economy. Um, what is the partnership's perspective on the circular economy? Um, but, I mean, we all, we all know or we all hear that circular economy is about system change. Um, and as a consequence, that concept is very, very broad. Uh, so for the partnership, we had to narrow that perspective a bit down to uh, the level where we, um, we could more or less have a practical framework for actions that would make sense on a local level. Um, and that's why we had uh, more or less this, uh, this, this concept where we, um, where, where, we, where we want to move away from the take, make, waste uh, 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 part of the um, um, the take make waste model, which is in fact uh, aimed at destroying value, uh, to a more circular perspective aimed at retaining value uh, as, as long as possible at the possi highest possible level in the the, the circular process in, in the economic process. Um, and that notion of circular economy is more than the recycling economy, because that's one of the problems that I run into into the debate every now and then, is that circular economy equals uh, a recycling economy, and that is not true. Um, circular economy is much more about the regulatory framework and policies around a consistent material hierarchy, uh, and that's, that's really key to it. And this consistency, uh, in turn, has to affect all steps of the value chain, from production, from product design to procurement, to also, in the end, the, the way that you organize your waste management. Um, based on this perspective, the Circular Economy Partnership has identified a number of barriers and bottlenecks uh, in, 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 regu in, in um, regulation, but also financing need and knowledge gaps, which led to an action plan on the three strands of uh, the urban agenda, better regulation, better funding, and better knowledge. First of all, the better regulation, we have three actions, and basically all these actions are, um, are directed at the principle that current legislation is not fit for the circular economy. It is, uh, in a way, very much risk-driven, which is uh, the logical thing to do when you talk about waste, uh, uh, for example, but we have to complement that with a more value-driven uh, 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 change in regulation, um, and that that is needed because we, ha in in a risk-driven in a risk-driven regulation, I think that we um, will end up by not being able to uh, to make that shift from a waste economy to a resource economy. Uh, the second one is better funding. Um, of course, everyone needs funding, everyone likes funding, everyone needs money. Uh, that is why it is so important that we mainstream circular economy in the European funding, uh, especially in the post-2020 funds. And I think that the, the ambitions that the new Commission has is already a very firm basis for this and can, um, can, 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 can help us with that. Uh, and another one is finding the funding. For a lot of cities especially, it is very hard to find the ways to fund their circular economy initiatives because, I mean, they are not yet business models, for example, that generate their own money and that are viable in itself already. So they still need funding for their initiative. Um, and that's why the partnership took up uh, uh, the, the task of developing a circular city funding guide. Um, which will be launched, if I'm not mistaken, the end of January uh, at the city's forum in Porto. I'm looking at Yanyan, Yan, she's nodding, okay. So. Uh, and then on better knowledge, I have grouped that a little bit into two, uh, two groups. Um, the first one being more or less on uh, urban resource management. So how do we use waste as resources for our economy? Um, and the second one is more, I, I, I would more or less characterize that as um, knowledge uh, actions on, on governance, so to speak. Um, one of them being a city, a city a circular city portal in which you can find a number of uh, good practices, but not only the good practices in the sense that in terms of results, but also in terms of what partners were involved, what was the process that, uh, that, that these practices uh, went through. Um, and what are, what are, what are the, the strengths, the weaknesses. 
Um, and the other one is a circular city indicators, which is also, which is still very, very uh, a, a nasty subject, in fact, because it is very, very difficult to get the right indicators. There are a number of initiatives, but they are all still very much in a sort of circular uh, frame, uh, so to speak. It's very, it's very difficult to get circular city indicators uh, on a, on a, uh, on the level of a circular economy. And the third one is the, the collaborative economy knowledge pack, as we have called it, and that is what will the next section will be about. Um, this was a subject of the targeted analysis, uh, which is still ongoing. Um, I'm a bit... Um, actually, the, the, the discussion about sharing economy or collaborative economy started here in Helsinki for the partnership. Um, I think it was at the Ministry of Economic Affairs here, uh, where we were in some kind of very small and hot room discussing what uh, sharing economy could be or should be and what the link is to, uh, the, to, to, the, to the circular economy. And at first, at the start of this, 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 uh, this discussion, the concept or was very much aimed at the digital platforms um, like Airbnb, Uber, eBay. Um, and during the discussion, we concluded that the, uh, the, these, these digital platforms are not the sharing economy. They are maybe uh, vehicles for the sharing economy. But on the other hand, also, we had the discussion about the nature and impact of these platforms, because you see, in, and I will have some examples later on, uh, you will see also that there are a lot of negative impacts of these, uh, this kind of platforms, uh, especially for, 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 for cities. Um, discussing a bit further, we found that there is a wide variety of characteristics by which the concept of collaborative economy can be defined. Uh, ranging from for-profit, for-benefit, centralized, decentralized, global, local, online, but also offline platforms and offline communities, because it doesn't always have to be online. And that is more or less, the, the, the result of that discussion is more or less illustrated by the, this picture where on the, uh, in the left uh, uh, hand top quad quadrant, let's say the for-profit, the globalized uh, uh, initiatives are, and uh, the for benefit and local uh, uh, initiatives are on the right hand side on the down uh, on in the on the right hand side down uh, uh, quadrant um, and that is in fact where uh, we want to focus because that is where in our view the benefits the local benefits of uh, the sharing economy and the collaborative economy uh, can be uh, can be reaped um, the next slide I think I will skip because I took that from, uh, I, I think that will be in the presentation of Lucas as well, probably. Um, so I will go on to uh, impact and evidence. Um, and I want to first share two examples with you. This is, let's say, the Airbnb uh, I, uh, effect uh, of um, uh, uh, sharing economy. What's yours is mine, winner takes all, I put there. It's a bit provocative, but this is the case of Amsterdam. This is a map of Amsterdam. Um, and in recent years, as in a whole lot of other cities, Amsterdam has been overwhelmed with an ever-growing number of Airbnb tourists um, with all the negative effects that go with it, uh, like, like noise, uh, noise nuisance, illegal renting, and the exacerbation of housing shortages, uh, ra rising prices of, of housing, uh, and also changing neighborhoods because the Airbnb uh, tourist is not interested in supporting the local community. They don't go shopping uh, in, in the neighborhoods where all these Airbnb rentals are. And as you can see from this picture, the orange dots or the red dots, they're all Airbnb rentals. The blue ones are the regular hotels. So you see that Airbnb is cannibalizing on, in fact, the whole fabric of the city in this case. So this is what we do not want as, as cities. And I, I mean, we, we don't all have this problem, but we, we, don't do, we don't want to do this. So 
um, one of the challenges is to find mechanisms to regulate this and to mitigate the negative effect of this kind of initiative. Um, the other one I want to share with you is a Dutch in initiative called Thuis Afgehaald, and it could be translated as uh, take away at home. Um, unfortunately, this is not in English. Uh, it's not, it, it, it has not been translated, but basically what this is is a meal sharing initiative. Uh, as we all know, when we cook for ourselves, we have a tendency to cook much more than we eat. So uh, they provide a platform where when you, uh, when you have a meal left, you put that meal on there on offer for people in your community, people in your neighborhood, uh, and then they come to your home and pick it up and eat it at home. Uh, that, that's the basic idea of it. Um, it's a national platform with very local roots, so to speak. Um, in the five, first five years of existence of this platform, they, uh, they, they shared 260,000 meals between neighbors, which is, uh, which is quite a lot for, for a platform that, that, that started uh, from scratch. Um, but what they did in 2017, they took the next step and said, well, let's introduce a matchmaking uh, uh, feature into our uh, uh, concept. And this matchmaking feature um, works in, in a way that they try to mit match a home cook with someone who is, let's say, more vulnerable member of society, elderly people, sick people, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, so that they will have healthy meals every day. Um, and this, they introduced this in 2017, and after one year, they tried to uh, evaluate uh, the impact of that. And um, what they found was that uh, people were really, really happy with this initiative. People could stay home much longer. They, they, had, less, uh, uh, they had less professional support uh, in healthcare, less professional support, uh, like, like, let's say, in the home. So they tried to translate that into hard currency, into hard euros. And what they found is that, um, although this is not a, 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 a linear economic uh, exercise, uh, they, they found that um, roughly between 2,000 and 4,500 euros in, in value was created uh, with every match that they made through this system. And this is one, uh, one exa uh, interesting example of uh, the principle, what is mine is yours and everyone benefits from it. And it's also good for the environment, for our footprint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that brings me to the conclusion uh, of the for the future. Um, first of all, maybe some, some personal observations about the Urban Agenda partnerships, uh, because our partnership will be discussing the future next week in Brussels. Uh, so everything I say is my personal view at the moment. But um, one, I, I want to share three points with you. The first one is that working on a multi-level and multi-stakeholder pa partnership has proven to be very, very, very valuable, uh, not only for, uh, from a standpoint of, of, of trust, but also understanding each other and defining common problems, common challenges, and defining uh, the common solutions to that. Um, but for the future of the urban agenda, I would personally like to look at not only these big partnerships that we are involved in now, but also look at the, the working methods that we have developed and see if that we can apply those in a more ad hoc uh, manner to um, uh, uh, on a more project-like basis. It could be very valuable as well. And a third one is that I have found uh, that the urban agenda should also take into account the link between the urban areas and the rural areas, which is f very important. Not all cities can do that, but there are a number of cities where this link is very important. Um, then uh, on the future of our action plan, a lot of actions, I mean, this partnership has run for three years now. A lot of actions uh, have not finished yet. We have to continue this action, developing proof of concept, test driving, prototyping, whatever. So we will continue with a number of these actions for, for the future. Uh, and then the, the, the last point, I think, is uh, the territorial evidence, and that is what this uh, slide is about. Um, as we have seen, uh, the, 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 the circular economy debate is in many ways a, a debate of, uh, about the impact economy. Um, and that is where I think the gathering of data is still insufficient. We know how to uh, gather data about, uh, uh, let's say, the linear economy, about 
uh, GDP, about jobs, about growth. But we don't know exactly still how to gather data and how to interpret data uh, 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 about the impact, the, the impact in terms of uh, inclusiveness, sustainability, social responsibility. So understanding and generating that data on the impact economy is, for me, essential for the future. And I think that is where um, the Urban Agenda and ESPON meet. Uh, and ESPON is well positioned and well, com well, well equipped to fill that gap and provide us with the missing link. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janarko, for, for, for this. I have, I, have, I have a small question for you. You will step in later uh, on the panel, but um, uh, and uh, we'll keep this, this uh, your, your, your ideas about territorial evidence for, for, for later. But I just wanted to, to, to come back to one thing you said in the beginning that was absolutely necessary to understand the, the, the need for switching from uh, um, waste management model and approach to something that will be more circular uh, and more uh, resource management. Uh, um, do you, how do you assess, uh, uh, since you're working on, on, on that topic together with uh, the, your, your colleagues among the partnerships, the, the, the success of this switch among regions and cities? Do you, do you consider that uh, you already gained some success and you notice some improvements, or what do you think? Um, we, we are still uh, at, at the beginning of this. Um, we are all looking for the right solutions, all experimenting. But the fact that there is an enormous uh, drive to do this um, uh, means that, that there, there is a firm base to develop this argument further. And I must say there are a lot of small initiatives and a lot of small successes that are already contributing. But one of the big challenges for the coming years will be how to create volume, how to grow uh, uh, in these initiatives. Because, because if we can't do that, then we don't have an economic model, I think. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting insight. I will come back, I'm sure, uh, to that a little bit later. So now let me please introduce and welcome uh, Carlos uh, on stage, who will present us the, the results of the project uh, CIRCTA on monitoring circular economy and the, its territorial consequences. Carlos is working for Technalia for already almost uh, a, a decade as a researcher and is specialized in uh, uh, green economy infrastructures, land management and circular economy. And, and you have become one of the most important partner of ESPON on these topics for, for, for the last years and we are really happy to welcome you today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nicola, for this nice presentation. Um, as well, thank you to everyone for being here in this uh, morning session. Um, I will present today, um, sorry, uh, an overview of um, the main results of the uh, sector project that has ended a few weeks ago. Yeah, it's working. Um, so the structure of the presentation is shown on the screen. It will basically address all the policy questions that were uh, posed on the terms of reference and, and exemplify or explain how we answered those questions from, from the project uh, in a very direct way. So territorial, uh, sorry, circular, circular is uh, about uh, circular economy. Uh, it stands for circular economy and territorial consequences. The project ran from 2017 until very recently. We just submitted the final report a few weeks ago. Uh, the project was led by Technalia, uh, but uh, it was participated by Asia Plus, Knowledge, Prognos, Technopolis, and Wuppertal Institute. And you can see here the logo of the Urban Partnership because we also cooperated with them in the project. So we uh, provided territorial evidence on the circular economy new sectoral definitions of the circular economy. Um, we analyzed territorial factors that affect the circular economy under a systemic perspective. We uh, reanalyzed data on uh, waste materials and waste streams. We explored the sectoral expression of circular economy, including circular business models, and we provided guidance to local and regional administrations. All these outputs answer these policy questions that were mentioned in the terms of reference. The first one was, what does the circular economy mean from a territorial perspective? 
what territorial factors influence the development of uh, towards the circular economy, and what territorial characteristics make regions and cities more or less optimal to support a circular economy. So in sector, we, we had performed a thorough review of um, territorial factors affecting the circular economy at regional and local levels. We found that land-based factors are particularly important for rural regions, of course, because they emphasize the relevance of natural endowments to provide, for example, um, um, biomass for uh, growing demand of biomass for a circular economy. Agglomeration factors provide circular businesses with the necessary access to resources, knowledge, and collaboration, as well as viable demand for circular products and services. This is fundamental for collaborative and uh, sharing economies, as Jaco was uh, mentioning before. Accessibility uh, is especially important for circular strategies that rely on physical exchanges of materials, um, particularly of low value materials, such as industrial symbiosis uh, platforms, for example, but also for cooperative and sharing economies. Knowledge and awareness are equally relevant for businesses, institutions, and community uh, communities because it directly impacts the behavior, behavior of households and businesses to embrace circular innovations. Technologies may enable the imp implementation of circular economy processes along the value chains, for example, uh, through schemes like eco-design or clean and production, but also unlock markets for circular um, uh, materials, particularly for low value materials. And we found that the governance and institutional levels together with territorial milieus act as transversal forces uh, supporting, promoting circular economies principles, but also enabling other factors to be more effect effective. A good example of how these territorial factors affect um, circular economy development are, for example, industrial symbiosis platforms, such as the Symbiosis project in Sicily, which was one of our case studies. This one emphasizes exactly why the relevance of factors like accessibility and industrial agglomerations enable these kind of uh, initiatives, but also how softer territorial factors based on competence among actors um, also support this establishment, the establishment of these uh, networks. The second policy question was, uh, what do material patterns and flows, including resources and waste, look like in European regions and cities, and how they have changed over the past 10 years? So in fact, one way of understanding how far we have uh, progressed towards the circular economy is looking at into material flows, uh, material and waste flows. Um, the maps on the screen describe the material consumption per capita across uh, regions on the left and the change between 2006 uh, and 2014 on the right. The indicator as shown is domestic material consumption that measures the total amount of materials that are consumed locally by local economies. It means extraction, plus imports minus exports, and the units are tons per inhabitant. The indicator is not a perfect circular economy indicator, of course, because it, is, it does not allow to uh, differentiate between renewable and non-renewable materials. It does not allow to differentiate, uh, more importantly, between primary and secondary materials. And it does not consider upstream consumption of materials that are embedded in um, imports. Still, it is the best indicator that we still have to track material consumption in Europe. So um, I will not get into the details of these um, figures. Uh, the average is around 13 uh, tons per capita per year. And of course, regions specialized in primary production, mine and agriculture, and first transformation of uh, raw materials, like for example, wood and pulp industries consume more materials on per capita basis than regions with more urbanized and service-oriented economies. Um, regarding the evolution over time, the regions that experienced a sharper decline in material consumption were those that were hit harder by economic crisis uh, in this period, uh, in the Mediterranean basin in particular, uh, whereas other regions in northern and eastern countries experienced an increase on in material consumption of their, this period. Another way of looking into this is uh, looking into waste generation per capita. Um, the maps are uh, showing waste generation per capita excluding major mineral waste. Um, these maps include both uh, production and consumption aspects. For example, it's including uh, household waste and also uh, 
um, industrial waste. Um, so the internal waste per capita ranges from around 600 tons uh, per capita up to more than 9,000 in Estonia due to oil shale exploitation in that country. The overall amount of waste generated is driven by population size, purchase capacity and economic structure of the territories. So waste generation is greater in the urbanized and industrialized regions for this reason. However, variation in these waste statistics um, across regions is mostly the outcome unstable, uh, unstable data collection system and unharmonized um, uh, data that undermine reliability of the estimates. Waste statistics in general are very poor quality, even at national levels. Because the policy incentive stemming from the Waste Framework Directive, uh, which established the market-based system for incentivizing recycling, has been so far oriented towards diversion of waste from landfilling, more than enabling effective recovery and reuse of materials. So this has led to an increased complexity in waste management practices with an increasing number of pretreatment uh, facilities and cross boundary shipments of waste. And the statistics as a result of that are not very reliable, are not even at national level, so these maps that have been realized and to the regional level are not much reliable either. But it is uh, what we can do with this data. So policy question, th the third policy question was how the approaches used to implement a circular economy, such as industrial symbiosis, clustering, traditional connectivity, energy and efficiency, and so forth, impact different types of regions and cities. One way of looking into this is focusing now on territorial activities, uh, economic activities that in principle are more related, more linked to circular economies. It is very difficult to, um, to do this exercise. It's not properly uh, the best way of uh, dealing with the uh, systemic dimension of circular economy, but still, given the information we have, it is the most um, uh, feasible or sensitive way of addressing this challenge. So if we, we look at these um, uh, economic activities, we found that uh, this circular economy uh, material providers category that includes um, all um, sectors, segments that deal with the provision of materials for circular economy, including uh, renewable energy and bio-based materials, but also secondary raw materials considered through waste management sectors, have a significant contribution already on European uh, economies with around 3.3 million jobs and have half a trillion euro in turnover already. Again, due to the contribution of sustainable agriculture and forestry to this sector, to this uh, group, which represents around half of the total employment in this uh, market segment, um, we see that uh, circular economy material providers are concentrated in rural, rural areas. Overall, the contribution to uh, regional employment ranges from 1% to 13% across Europe. One example uh, that illustrates how important material providers can be in a regional and local economies is this bioeconomy cluster in central Germany, which was one of the our case studies. And here, cooperation between regions, companies, and innovation centers have led to the development of the largest bioeconomy cluster in Europe, which is now being internalized, internationalized to other neighboring countries. But uh, here we identified a number of challenges related to market uptake of bio-based products, for example, and also in relation to regulations uh, on bioeconomy in general that creates some uncertainty, uncertainties on the extent to which this circular bioeconomy could be uh, actively contributing uh, to um, answer the challenges that rural regions have in terms of uh, employment, um, jobs, uh, and, and, and so forth. So another good example of how circular economy material providers can transform local economies, it was the uh, bicycle strategy in Maribor. Here, strong investments on sorting and recycling infrastructures have been put in place to allow the Maribor to meet its ambition to increase its recycling rate by around 30% and increase the share of reusable waste more from 14 to uh, 40%, 44% in the years to come. This strategy is also a good example of how citizens can lead these transformations as the whole strategy is an answer, it's a response to um, citizens' opposition to landfilling in the city. Then if we look at the another uh, market uh, classification, uh, which is the circular economy technology providers, 
uh, which includes all activities that produce the necessary technical equipment and machinery for a circular economy, including green technologies and services and other market segments. We found that already around 2.5 million jobs and, most, and, and almost 400 billion euro in turnover are being produced by these uh, segments, representing around uh, between 1 and 3% of local economies. Hence, this group is more evenly distributed for, uh, across uh, European territories, but still is more concentrated in urban and rural areas. A good example of these um, um, circular economy material providers and how industry-led uh, strategies for circular economy can be promoted is this uh, group of uh, initiatives in the Basque Country that will promote or emphasize the circular economy as a driver, driver for industrial competitiveness and innovation. Um, with a variety of instruments ranging from green procurement, eco-design tools, new standards for products, and so forth. The fourth and last question was, what is the potential for implementing the circular economy in European regions and cities, and what kind of policy action is needed? Um, in what type of regions to ensure a, move, a smooth transition to a circular economy? A way of reflecting on these uh, potentials is to look into the circular economy business models. Um, we classified circular economy business models in these groups, access sharing and performance models that are built around sharing economies, like for example carpooling, new utilization patterns that include various forms of product service systems and servitization schemes, like for example chemical leasing, um, long, uh, long life design of products such as eco-design strategies, and extension of products and resource value and at end of life stages through strategies like remanufacturing, upcycling, and so forth. All these circular business models uh, implement the circular economy strategies that you can see uh, to the left of the, of the screen that were uh, the, the, the 10 R's uh, promoted and proposed by the PBL, the Dutch Environmental Agency. So in SIGTAR, we mapped these uh, innovative circular business models using a web crawling methodology that allow us to identify early adopters. These are companies uh, that um, have already likely implemented these uh, business models based on their own uh, websites and, and reports and claims. So uh, we then characterize these companies in terms of number of units, employment and turnover using the Orbis database. So we found that across Europe, over 9,000 companies already are likely to operate secret business models with 1 million employees and a turnover of around 260 billion euros. The implementation of diffusion of secret business models is in general favored by the national and, uh, and urban agglomerations, as you can see on the maps. Proximity factors provide businesses and industrial agglomerations with benefits due to shared economy, shared access to information, networks, suppliers, providers distributors and also resources and in urban agglomerations we saw that this uh, concentration of people and uh, economic activities can facilitate strategies such as take back programs or reverse logistics for reliable stream of, of materials and that is why uh, these uh, business models are more likely uh, or more spread in urban areas so how to support regions and cities in the transition towards a secure economy we promoted we developed this guide for uh, local and, region, uh, and regional uh, stakeholders um, uh, that aim to uh, guide uh, these actors through the design of circular policies and strategies at circular and regional and local levels. Uh, we pro propose a stage-based approach that helps regions and cities access the local, assess the local context and potentials for a circular economy, define policy priorities, set out the right governance and implementation mechanisms, and also ensure the right framework conditions via policy mixes. This is the structure of the guide. Uh, just to emphasize that besides this stage-based uh, based, uh, process or procedure to guide uh, uh, this um, strategy development process, we also provided um, support in terms of concepts, definitions, and other uh, classification elements, and also useful resources um, like existing studies, guides, manuals, and so forth. I have selected two good examples uh, from our case studies of strategies at regional and local levels that in our view represent very well how um, uh, powerful circular economy strategies 
can be developed at these levels. The first example is from uh, Scotland. Uh, it is the making things last strategy of Scotland that aims to put this territory at the forefront in the shift towards a more circular economy with a range of a specific objectives focused on reduced material consumption and waste generation, improved productivity and economic resilience, and stronger communities. At the local level, a strategy that uh, reflects quite well all these principles is the Brussels plan for a circular economy. The interesting thing about this economy is that it is that it, it is totally based on previously existing work, so it's very incremental. Um, and also it is very participated. It boosts dialogue and cooperation among a long list of stakeholders. So to summarize the main lessons from our case studies are that reaching a critical mass is fundamental due to the relevance of agglomeration factors uh, for circular business models, that political leadership uh, and participation of a wide array of actors and stakeholders is, is also fundamental to keep momentum, that place-based policy approaches that take account of the installed capacities are absolutely fundamental. Uh, all circular economy initiatives that have been successful uh, have been successful because they are based on, on local assets, they are based on, on, on local economies, and they focus on the transformation of those economies into circular. They are not aiming at transforming from scratch uh, one economy, economy from A to B, but to transform what they already have and based on their own capacities. So the, uh, for this reason, uh, we also identified that the existence of previous initiatives helps a lot to activate or reactivate already existing processes. And that knowledge and awareness is uh, a factor that seems to be much more important than the uh, physical assets like infrastructure, technology, and, th and things like that. So let me uh, finalize the presentation with a few key messages for the design of territorial and cohesion policies. First of all, a systemic shift should be, uh, through, throughout the value chain, should be at the heart of the circular strategy. We all share this view. Uh, anyone who works in circular economy uh, very quickly understands that we are talking about systemic transformations and that we have to work with systemic transformations if we really will aim at transforming these uh, economies from linear to circular. That behavioral change uh, should be promoted as a fundamental strategy to for closing material loops. That when possible, the circular economy action should be mainstreamed to the uh, uh, three strategies. And uh, coming back to what Jan was mentioning about funding, we, we also think that um, promoting funds directed to uh, SMEs should be aligned with the circular economy principles and objectives. Uh, transversally, and that also other forms of uh, funding, um, private to private funding, should also uh, be promoted. Finally, we, we also recommended in our report that the EU circular uh, strategy uh, on the circular economy should be integrated within the territorial agenda post 2020 somehow. And that's all for the time being. Thank you. Um. Carlos, stay here, please. Can you please join me here? <laughs> All my friends. <laughs> um, what kind of uh, problems do you met? Uh, do you meet with uh, finding the data, collecting the data, and uh, can you identify a profile of uh, regions uh, most advanced? And can you explain why they are in this situation? Yeah, well, I, as it was explained in the presentation, there is not uh, there's not much data available uh, so far in the circular economy at a territorial level uh, from, from Eurostat. What we have is a monitoring framework that has been created quite recently that basically works on previously, previously existing indicators to build this monitoring framework and then recombines, recombines information and data uh, f to that aim. So we basically had, and we, by the way, the six project ran in parallel to that process. So we, we didn't have even this monitoring framework set already when we started. And what we found is that there's a great scarcity of data uh, also uh, because it's, it's the circular economy has had not been um, 
very well um, structured and conceptualized before. So it was very challenging. So in the end, we worked with these basics in basic indicators available from Eurostat, and we downscaled those indicators, material consumption of various um, types of materials, and also waste, waste uh, production, waste streams and waste categories, and we regionalized the, the, the data. So we found that the material um, indicators had some limitations because they were not designed initially to track these processes, circularity, uh, um, degrees of secondary materials, only final uh, cons material consumption, these kind of things. So it was um, challenging from that perspective, but the uh, indicators as such were well-defined, the data was reliable, and so forth. But with waste uh, indicators, the, the, the story is totally different. Um, these indicators on waste are being produced essentially as a um, self-reporting process that local and regional administrations or uh, waste operators report to national statistical offices and those report to your set. So that process of reporting uh, data is totally um, connected with the data, with the waste management processes that they are uh, been through. So essentially what they are reporting is the data uh, based on what the waste streams they collect and sort for recycling. So for example, you have data on recycling, which is based on, on, on that. It's based on how much, uh, how much waste you, re you recover, sort, and separate or treat for recycling. But then if you go to the, um, you think about how much of that waste potentially, that can be potentially recycled, is actually recycled, then you realize that it's totally different. The most, or a big share of that, uh, of that sh waste is actually exported. But the statistic tells that we are recycling, uh, then, uh, and we are already, uh, for most regions are already complying with the targets. So there is a huge gap here between data on waste management, uh, the, the data quality, and also the waste management that needs to be uh, think about. And the message for local um, actors and, and regions would be to try to uh, understand better uh, wh what is happening with the waste they are sorting for recycling once um, it's already allocated to some operator because they might be surprised on what, uh, what is going on with that. And the message for Eurostat and, um, and uh, national statistical offices would be try to collect data on the amount of waste that is being actually rec uh, recycled the amount of materials that have been actually recovered, uh, not so much on how much uh, waste is being sorted for. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Um, I'm sure we will probably come back to this kind of uh, issues and, and, and mismatch and misunderstanding about what's happening uh, in waste and collection and management, uh, and especially uh, the, the impacts of that for, for local authorities later on in the debate and maybe with your questions. Um, but no, I would like to, to, to welcome uh, Lucas, please. <laughs> you, you, you can have your, your glass of water first if you want. Uh, just to let me, to let me say that you're um, uh, Associate Director for VVA Economics and Policy in, in Brussels. You're specialized in collaborative and circular economy. You're currently leading a lot of projects for European Commission and European institutions. And you're also uh, working for, for Espen as uh, the, the lead manager for this uh, sharing project that you will present and share with us the, the result right now. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicola. Um, yeah, as uh, Nicola already said, we, um, ha it has been a pleasure in the last year um, to be working on this sharing project. And this um, the sharing project is in so far a bit um, special, in my view, because it, 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 um, it be combines two concepts that have been in discussion quite a lot in, in, in recent times, circular economy and collaborative economy. And although um, they have been very often mentioned together, obviously there are important differences in that. But one common thread about them is really that they're both very positively, um, positively attached to it. And circular, it doesn't, it doesn't, can't be wrong, can't it? And um, the whole concept of sharing is also very positively connotated. So we really uh, talk about two concepts that are very attractive. 
but on the other hand, very diffuse. So we have these huge, um, we have, um, we have concepts that um, are understood differently, that are used differently in, 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 in different contexts, and are quite quite hard to grasp and to um, um, objectify in some way. Um, <clears throat> so why why are we working on this study? And in, in a way, the the, the 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 point is that basically the question that we are starting with: How can the collaborative and circular economy? Um, in different cities, how can they contribute to these different um, uh, sustainability challenges that they have? And obviously there is a, a, a broad range of, of sustainability challenges that cities face today. Um, we have only a small, um, small subset here, but basically there is a, something about economic growth and social exclusion. So making sure that all the citizens um, um, benefit from economic growth and that economic growth in the first case happened um, in the first year. There is there's also a lot of climate change and, envi and the environment. So um, improving the resource use we have used, we have heard about that enough. Uh, and the, obviously the whole topic of energy transition is one, one important there. Then, <coughs> obviously, the, the whole question of space use, and we have that for this morning on, Jan Hake already said something about Amsterdam and how basically Airbnb totally changed the, um, the way the, the space is used. And obviously, um, that's an important factor. So how collaborative economy uses space, in an, and basically by that um, has an impact on, on, old, on suburbanization, but also on quality of life in cities is quite an important factor. And that has to be all put into context when demographic change is happening at the moment and in terms of aging, in terms of migration and the skills levels that are needed for future economies. And that's that's all. And in all those areas, uh, both the, uh, the, um, the, the circular and the collaborative economy were, always, were very often mentioned as being one of the um, topics, one of the um, ways of how these, how these um, challenges can be addressed. And we had this, a version of that slide already on, therefore I won't, uh, but the circular economy is, is a huge undertaking. It can um, can affect a huge number of sectors and in different ways because it's sometimes on the design stage that it can um, happen. It can sometimes, it's about recycling and, um, and the use of waste. It is something about changing production processes. So it's, um, it's a huge range of activities and sectors that go on. And then if you, then put additionally another slide that has been already shown, therefore I will also make quicker. Uh, they ha you have the collaborative economy, you have these in the discussion very much, the, the big platforms like Uber, like um, Airbnb, a Kickstarter. But obviously there is, there is an, a, a more local and more decentralized um, um, uh, collaborative economy, and sometimes also a very old one because in uh, cooperatives are, in our view, a form of, uh, can be a form of collaborative economy, for example. And they basically, and these type of local and, and very often not-for-profit organizations that have been working in the community for a while and are now more and more uh, new versions of that are springing up, um, they have been discussed far little and understanding more about what they can contribute to the sustainability goals we've mentioned before is one important uh, factor in this. So what we were trying to do is bring these two concepts together and make it, uh, uh, make a, make a plausible, um, 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 a, a broad range for this, for the, to understand these two concepts. And from us, the understanding, and that obviously there can be many dimensions, there, but for us, the, 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 the key distinction of the two concepts is that when we talk about circular economy, we always talk about the end or the aim of, uh, of, uh, of the process. So what <coughs> we are trying to reach, we're trying to reach a better resource use. So of keeping keeping resources longer and, and higher value in the um, in the um, economic process, using less primary resources, making sure that less emissions come out of the resources that are not used anymore, and that's um, that's what the what the aim of everything is. While we are seeing the collaborative economy more as the mean, so. Um, um, in n n the organizing the process in a collaborative way. So using resources together, um, um, sometimes for profit, sometimes not, using an underutilized uh, assets in some way together, that is what um, signifies the collaborative economy for us. 
And basically, therefore, we have all, all we discussing this, the, the collaborative economy, how can the collaborative economy um, 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 contribute to, um, to achieving this circular economy objective? And I think that's um, that's quite an important um, um, important understanding. And by that, we were, were trying to basically help um, regions to regions and cities to um, to work uh, to work with the collaborative economy. Because what have we have been told in our all our work and also before our work is that obviously these concepts are so broad that it's quite difficult to really operationalize that uh, for, for cities and regions. So what can I do in our, in my city and region to basically uh, foster that? What, what can I use the collaborative economy for? What is the collaborative economy in my city? And so what the first thing that we try to do is making, uh, making a, bringing a concept together that makes this easier to understand what, um, what the collaborative economy can be used for and what circular economy objectives it might be, um, it might be used for. And that's, um, that's why we basically developed this typology and the concept of what, 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 what these two, um, what, what it brings together. Um, then also, obviously, when cities and regions want to do policy, they have to understand the impacts. And so um, what we are doing in the, in, the case, in, in the six case studies we're working on is really trying to understand what positive environmental, economic, and social impacts have been reached by those um, initiatives and um, what can we learn from that. And then the last thing is um, uh, that we're trying to do is really a practical guide. So how can um, um, regions and cities identify the first the initiatives that are worth, uh, that are that are basically supporting their ob their policy objectives and how can um, and can how can they support them when they have identified them. Yeah, as uh, as said, we're working in, uh, in 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 six um, in six territories, and the territories um, uh, we use the very broad term territories because they are quite um, they are quite different. We have four cities. Um, we have Prato in Italy and Porto in in Portugal, and Den Haag in the Netherlands, and Maribor in the um, in in Slovenia. They are very they are very different in many in many ways. Porto is the basically the second biggest city um, in 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 Portugal, and because it's north of Portugal, it's it's the biggest city in the surroundings. So it's the center of the of of the region in in that way. Um, Den Haag is obviously one city among a bigger a bigger city um, in in that way. Um, Prato is a bit it's similar. It's it's in a way uh, it's a, it's very close to Florence. So so it's but it's a bit has a very long manufacturing history. So it has a totally different history than than Florence um, with a trading and uh, and and no tourism history, and 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 it's it, but it's attached to that and so. And then we have obviously, obviously the country and um, um, uh, the, um, one country like um, Greece that basically was discussing it from from a, from a, from a national perspective, and Flanders as a region from uh, discussing this whole thing from a regional uh, regional perspective. <coughs> And what is quite uh, what is quite what was quite interesting in, in that is basically that we discussed with them what what objectives do you have for the collaborative? What do you want the collaborative economy ha you helping to achieve? And and um, although basically we talk we started off with a with a circular economy, so with an environmental discussion, very often um, the um, the discussion had other objectives in, in engrossed in that, and that was for example in part of the regeneration of urban space because they have some. Um, amount of urban um, buildings, but also other spaces that are unused that they they would like to bring in better use. You, you have in Maribor um, um, the, the whole question of cooperative economy networks and the waste streams. How can you use the waste, uh, organize the waste streams better? In Greece, obviously, seeing the recent economic history, the whole question of poverty reduction and um, and transition towards a green energy. How how can this be linked? And so each of the regions had its own. Um, its own concept and its own ideas, what they wanted to reach with the collaborative economy, and it, this is quite log and this is quite logical that this is also possible because the collaborative economy as had is is a is a huge area. We have this the areas of um, using space together, so basically either built up space like co working spaces or also um, the the classical Airbnb basis, so renting out space. Um, um, 
for, for, for short-term uses in, in, in some way. But we have um, also waste um, cooperatives or waste organizations that where they collect waste and bring it to better use. We have um, um, obviously different types of transport, um, which is also uh, well known. But so there is a broad range of initiatives that can be um, done. And how much, uh, what, what impacts they have really depend on what services they're delivering it's one on one hand, but it also depends on the territorial characteristics. We have talked about Amsterdam and basically um, an already dense um, living situation made even denser and with that even more expensive and more difficult to, to organize by this, um, by this um, Airbnb renting out. And um, so in other areas that might be not a problem because there's, there's less density in the first place. And so the territorial characteristics in many ways influence that. And obviously the policy influence at all. And what we are trying to basically build up um, a model, a way of thinking that how do you basically think through what an initiative can bring you in terms of uh, impact and how, what to do to help it achieve that, to help it achieve that. I think there, there, there are a few examples that I very quickly go through. It's basically, first of all, first an example is made in Warwick. It's in The Hague. And, um, and what, um, what it is, is a mixture between a co-working space and the repair cafe. And so what, what they're trying to induce and is basically repair, remanufacture, reuse of, um, of, um, of, um, of, of waste. And um, at the same time, provide co-working <laughs> space to, um, to, to um, entrepreneurs who, who want to try out certain things in, in, in this area. And I think they have basically and they, they, they have been quite successful in, in, in many ways. So the resource savings of that is, is difficult to, um, to, to pin down because every little project in this, in this made of more has its resource use um, implications, but that's, that's over quite, uh, quite a while. But obviously there is, there is a job creation angle here. Uh, basically there have been 20, 20 jobs have been created while they are, uh, they are hoping to go even further very soon. And and obviously, there have been many um, ent entrepreneurs coming from that, so it has been a, a, a bit of a, um, 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 a, a spot for um, uh, helping entrepreneurs along. And um, and I think um, uh, what what uh, the, the, and this was also a big of a social impact. Basically, it is it is um, situated in an area which has a lot of people that are, have difficulties on the labor market. And um, basic by that, basically, they're also trying to reduce um, social poverty. And I think the most important point here is that the, 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 the way they, within this, with this quarter, within this area of Den Haag, they have basically created a meeting space again. So creating uh, so where people come together, meet and exchange, and that, that has not been there before in that way. And I think that social cohesion, that meeting space is coming up <coughs> again and again. Um, more in, in Marigold, for example, there is Robin Food, which is basically a, waste, um, a food waste collector uh, cooperative. They, they collect, food, uh, they collect food, food that basically would have been thrown away by others and basically um, sell it on um, to, to, um, to poor people in the, in the neighborhood. And that's basically they have now a, a couple of people employed, so there are some economic benefits, but the biggest one is probably the social economy, you know, that basically they have lots of savings for poor people and that they calculated at 100 euro per month per household, seeing that the average household income is 1,000 euro, it, that's quite a lot um, in, in many ways. Um, and then the third example is, is Hota La Porta in Porto, which is basically community gardens in, in the, really in the middle of the city and very, very nicely located in this, um, in this, terraced, um, in this terraced way. And um, obviously, again, the, the, the same is that basically they're, they're crea have creating these green gardens and that means a lot of, um, a lot of um, households that wouldn't be able to afford a garden or house with garden in Porto. Um, or would move would have to move far outside and create suburbanization to have it. I can create it within within the city, and obviously there are um, there are savings. Uh, there are some savings for the municipality because some um, bio waste can be basically recycled through that. But there is also a huge quality of life impact in, in that, and um, and also sa the savings for you thus due to the self production of vegetables. 
And so each have very specific um, ways of uh, improving um, social goals, improving environmental goals um, in that way. And I think therefore it, it's so important that basically we cannot provide a huge um, an overview on how all cities have to do that and have to look for those type of initiatives and only for that. It, uh, this is just in our view not possible because each city, each region has very specific objectives and very specific um, <coughs> circumstances to, um, to consider. And therefore the first thing that we always say is um, basically you have to get to know what, what's in there because Collaborative economy, that sounds always so uh, big, and especially if we talk about Airbnb, huge companies, the collaborative economy we're talking here about, these are a bunch of people that have started to work together on something. And so there's no way around getting to know what type of people you have here, what type of groups, what are they interested in, what are they doing, and what do you want to do in, in that way? Because if you don't get to know that, um, then, then you, pay, you, you won't find the ones that you really should push in, in that way. And I think that's, that's the, the, the biggest, the biggest um, thing that, that has to provide. There are many ways of doing this. Um, very often we, we have thought about one-stop shops, that basically a, a, a group of people within the uh, local administration that is responsible for, as a, as a gateway for, for the social entrepreneurs, for the social cooperatives, to um, to um, um, interact with the city because it's quite easy to get lost in the different um, in the different departments of, uh, of of a local authority and in in that way um, we basically but it's also a, it's a two way process so really understanding what type of people you have is 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 is, is another um, it's also by getting these contacts you can easy more easily learn as a local authority to how how basically these different initiatives can learn from each other. There's an important way that these initiatives very often are not meant to grow or don't want to grow um, or not to want to replicate hugely, but uh, want to grow hugely, but they could replicate. They, so they could far easily growing the impact by, um, by helping to build a clone uh, of themselves in, in neighboring um, um, areas because very often they have a very local um, feel to that. Um, and I think the European, at the European level, the, the exchange, um, providing that exchange of knowledge and good practices, um, is 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 the key is the key um, 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 the key recommendation to go down. We, as you I mentioned, uh, didn't mention before, is we follow the same line in terms of better better knowledge, better regulation, better funding, because we we wanted to work together in that. And I think um, on the better regulation, it's really understand uh, it's really to understand. What is the um, key? Uh, what 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 do these initiatives need? And again, that obviously um, has as a precondition to get it to know them. Um, you have to understand it's very often a, a, a group of people that that want to basically create a, uh, that want to create and want to um, 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 make running a certain project, and they are not administrative experts very often, and so. Um, for them, uh, and they sometimes start this at least as amateurs, really, um, um, uh, beside their their day-to-day -day job, and so helping them to basically um, navigate this, the, this this regulation is quite an important uh, can be quite an important part um, of the work, and uh, the same uh, is very often said of SMEs, and I think lots of arguments apply in the same way that you basically, um, if you want to. Um, um, if you want to support them, you have to basically um, help them understanding the administrative frameworks and, and work these administrative frameworks for. Um, and it's also about uh, being a bold and using um, experimentation and more flexible approaches. Um, basically, you, you, you can't basically see whether a group, an uh, important success factor of collaborative economy initiatives is, is always whether these group of peoples work well together. And very often you can only find that by letting them try. And then sometimes it might work and sometimes it not work well. So being also uh, open for experimentation and then understanding which approaches work and which probably not um, is quite, a, um, quite an important part of that. Um, and lastly, I think obviously the better funding and I think, um, yeah, I think more funding is always, uh, always uh, um, the thing that is demanded everywhere. Um, but I think for me, it's more of the uh, the, the, the better funding that is um, that is okay. So, 
you have to understand these initiatives are, some of them can create market income and some of them will never create market income because that's not their aim. Um, and it's not their, uh, their purpose and they, they don't work in that way. And, um, and um, for those, you have to think the whole funding structure through. And you know, basically very often you have these three years starting funds or two years starting funds and then you have to uh, work on your own. And that, if, if, and, and that's fine for some, obviously, for, for, for some organization that might be the right funding, but for others, you should think through what the funding is afterwards, because uh, if you don't think um, the funding as a, in, a, in a whole life, then probably you create, um, you create projects that then end very quickly after, after the funding drop. And, and obviously, uh, for, for local authorities, very often, providing other types of resources is an important part. <coughs> And so not only, not only grants, which are of very often the funding is scarce, um, but also looking at ac accommodation for initiatives, looking at administrative support for initiatives, looking at other types of ways of supporting can be equally successful and, and sometimes more available because in some cities they have a lot of uh, real estate that is underused, not used. And, um, and bringing this into play can, can make a huge difference. Um, yeah, and I think that, um, for that, for that um, obviously, yeah, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Lucas, maybe I have a question. Um, did you have something you, was it something common uh, with all the, the cases you studied? And uh, did you have the feeling that they wanted to grow and to scale up and to become an economic model? Y yes, I think um, two things. There, there is the, the, the common thing that, uh, that, that I was always coming back to, this group of people or a bunch of people that, that work together. And this is really a common thing. That, and you have to do all the, all the recommendations. You, you have to think through in that way. Do, does it work? It's a group of people, the successful ones are a group of people that work well together, that like achieving something. And on the growth thing, they obviously, they all have a certain, sorry, either a, a certain um, objective in, in that way. Either they think, well, actually the poverty in the area is so bad, they, they want to do something for, for poor people. Or they're thinking about um, environmental objectives. Or, they all have a certain objective and they want this objective really, so they, they would like to grow in terms of impact. But on the other hand, the, the t this group of people has certain limits um, because uh, everyone knows if you work together with 10 people well, that doesn't mean if the next 10 people come along that this works equally well. It, yeah, it's, it's not given at least. And so there are some limits to that um, also from the business model and therefore I think um, you always, uh, in some cases, you can um, bring this on. In some cases, we, we had these uh, initiatives that were basically first a gardening initiative, so a local, a local um, um, uh, common garden, and then they basically created an energy um, cooperative, and then they created a car sharing initiative. So it was the same type of people that were growing into different fields. But, um, but yeah, I think, therefore, you always have to think about growing and or replicating, because in some cases, the replicating is probably the more efficient way. Thank you, Lucas. Now we are going for the last uh, presentation, and we are really happy to, to welcome uh, Yanya Kreitmeier uh, Mackenzie. You're working for a senior counselor for, for the Ministry in Slovenia of Environment and Special Planning. Um, we, we wanted to, to, to hear you today also because it was important for us to have a, um, the opinion of a member state. We're discussing also the, 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 the views of uh, regions and cities, but it's also interesting to, to have your view as representative of a member state because you also have to manage and to cope with different kinds of territories. And uh, we really like and look forward to, to understand and to, to, and to know what you think about uh, all that and to present us also the way Slovenia um, handle with uh, this uh, partnership because you are an active member of the partnership as Anarko said and please um, if you want to share with us your views about that we'll be really glad. Hello everyone and uh, thank you Nicolas for the introduction and thank you also for invitation to this workshop it's really interesting for me to be here and to be able to exchange views in this way. 
Please tell me how much time you have left. I think nine. Hmm? Ten? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me tell you really briefly at the beginning uh, how we um, started this process in Slovenia, just to be able to uh, be more clear later on. Uh, it all started in 2014 when we drafted a framework for program for transition to a green economy. Oops. Something wrong with that? Um, so, um, shall I speak closer or not? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, that's better. Thank you. Uh, we we um, were uh, first assessing what's the situation in Slovenia, how is the state of mind, and we realized we cannot talk about circular economy yet because the, that model was it in 2014 uh, very unknown and people were thinking that they were left out if they, uh, we were talking about circular economy. But we did put the circular economy model as a priority. But the reason we did this um, uh, framework program was to set up um, a kind of um, a structure for us to be able to work. And first, uh, we were thinking that transition to circular economy is really a process uh, that involves all parts of the society. So we started to communicate different roles of everyone, and we also created four pillars of work for us to do, uh, to be able to kind of get on a roll. And uh, our main uh, strategy was really communication to the stakeholders and also communication within the governmental sectors. So we had uh, four pillars uh, working with the governmental sectors on horizontal level, to have a dialogue with stakeholders, to compile best uh, practices, and uh, to um, kind of uh, disseminate and um, uh, raise awareness. Uh, so for doing that, we needed some kind of different structure. So um, we created this uh, partnership um, uh, for a green economy, which was really a collaborative work between governmental sectors and stakeholders. First, we brought together the key sectors and we, um, wanted to have really high decision level, but not the ministers, because with the ministers it's really hard to get a meeting. So we decided for states, state secretaries. And first few months we were just working with the sectors, the governmental sectors, to try to convince them that what they do is relevant for circular economy and how it is relevant. And when we felt confident enough, uh, we um, expanded this partnership to all the stakeholders in Slovenia. And we were really proud that on our first meeting, we had already hundred different stakeholders coming that wanted to be involved in this process. And uh, again, it was very important for us how we were communicating. We wanted to bring together people that really want to constructively help, not just to uh, debate uh, and argue, but to actually find solutions together. And um, uh, we, uh, with time of working, we got more than 2,000 stakeholders in the course of two years that came work with us. Uh, so at the very beginning of our work, uh, we identified businesses, but also cities as a key enablers for making this transition. So we really focus a lot on cities and local communities. I have to say that for us in Slovenia, we have very small cities. So uh, there's quickly you're talking about municipality or a local community where there is a one uh, relatively small town and the rest is rural. So we kind of, in many cases, this is connected from the beginning. And that's why we also entered this partnership uh, of Urban Agenda, uh, because we wanted to gain uh, knowledge from different um, levels. Uh, and we liked that the structure of partnership was combined with cities, uh, member states, and other uh, and the representative organizations and, uh, uh, and the European Commission. So we focused, uh, Slovenia focused in this partnership uh, in several actions, but uh, most particularly in the circular city governance because we wanted to um, have something to offer cities uh, to encourage them to start this uh, journey to circular economy. Uh, so we are doing this action together with OVAM from Flanders and uh, EIB. And uh, in the first part of the action, we assessed what is uh, the situation and uh, realized that really there is a big fear on starting this journey. There are big cities that have capacity, they have research departments, and they are capable of uh, 
drawing up a strategy, thinking about it, getting the knowledge. But there are also uh, many smaller cities that uh, think this is not for them and they are too far away from that and they don't have the knowledge and they don't have the people to do it. So we wanted to provide them with a very easy to use on tool. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm missing that slide today, <laughs> but it's the infographic we created um, for um, putting on a, s a circular city portal that we want to place. Um, um, and uh, it's really um, uh, having uh, it's just the basic idea how the city governance can start with the circular models and linking them to practical examples and to also to all the other uh, actions of our partnership to give them more um, uh, easy way to, to, to get the knowledge and to get uh, to not to be afraid uh, to take. So it's really a big importance also in the way how things are communicated. They are not uh, uh, going too deep into the research, but they are more presented for uh, easy to use for them. Uh, so with all this knowledge also in Slovenia, we went um, down on a local level. So the government went down to regions and local communities and we covered uh, territorially whole Slovenia uh, involved every local community was informed about and every company and any um, kind of um, um, entities that are working uh, or wanted to work on circular economy and uh, brought together to work uh, on these finding solutions and finding proposals and that uh, actually brought us uh, to uh, creation of the roadmap of Slovenia towards circular economy, which was really a collaborative work of uh, stakeholders and the government. And uh, uh, this is story on itself, but I'm happy to say that now we are entering more implementation phase and uh, all this process enabled us that now five ministries together, we are um, creating a program uh, first is a three-year program with the help also of the Climate Kick and EIT uh, that will set up um, a base for systemic change because um, the, the hardest thing is to bridge the gaps between um, silences of sectoral silences at the governmental level but also uh, at other levels, also at the European level. And uh, we want to bridge this gap by having the program that uh, will enable us to join the measures and pro projects of governmental sectors and work together with the target, focus on the targets. Uh, and uh, for that, we are also creating Center for Circular Economy, which will be um, coordinating all these uh, um, projects and activities, but also serve as a platform for cooperation, for knowledge sharing, and for, um, uh, for building the value chains uh, among sectors. So, that is very shortly, <laughs> and uh, you asked me to talk about um, the connection with ISPON as well. I see these two projects that were uh, presented today, of course, uh, directly linked to what we are doing. Uh, I see uh, three or four type of links. One is that we can also link with our portal uh, with information. Uh, the other thing is that we identified a lot of knowledge gaps that we are not able to cover in our partnership and in these uh, activities that we are doing that we could uh, further on collaborate it with ISPON, like it's already the share, uh, sharing uh, project. Uh, then uh, um, we see that the tools that are created by ISPON can be maybe uh, communicated for an uh, easy to use way uh, for the local communities and regions. Uh, who are maybe not the researchers, all of them. <laughs> so, uh, and um, uh, yeah, and maybe some uh, targeted analysis could follow up from this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yanya. Yeah, we are um, going close to, to, to an end of this workshop, but we still have some, some, some questions for you, and I'm sure that you might have also some questions in the room, but so we're ready also to take one of one, uh, one or two, uh, maybe just for uh, Yanya and Yanarko. Uh, you, were, you were saying uh, and, uh, at the end that uh, um, going further in, in filling some knowledge gaps and territorial evidence gaps is something that could be really, really important for you as a member state, and uh, that's also what you were saying at, at the end of your presentation, Yanarko. Could you give us some uh, ideas or insight of what you think could be the next useful step forward in terms of uh, 
um, yes, filling knowledge gaps and bringing new territorials evidence uh, on, on the table uh, so that we as one also uh, know maybe potentially how to further support uh, uh, the, the partnership in the future. Well, um, uh, they, I, mean, I think there will many be uh, uh, deriving as we are working on, but right now uh, uh, we see uh, like the most directly we are uh, missing uh, case studies for certain, uh, certain um, guides that we are providing because we notice that uh, when we talk theoretically to cities or local communities, it's really good that they see what does that mean in a, a hands-on example. So we could, we could have more of that. Uh, then more uh, data, how to measure certain things. This is, uh, we have also indicators action and this is really good to combine this knowledge because a lot has been done already. Uh, because in the indicators uh, action, we focused on uh, the data that actually can be collected and, and have potential to be collected, not the data that will never be able to be collected. <laughs> collected. Uh, so this is really good information also for the state. For instance, we can uh, provide uh, changes in our regulation in the requirements for our companies, how to collect data if we have the right, uh, but also for the policy makers, uh, it's very important to get uh, very usable information. What now I can do? Okay, I see this is a problem. We don't have this kind of data. so. What should I ask for? What should I? Because we have a lot of power, a lot of tools that we can use them if we choose to. And uh, this is also, that's why it's good to have cities and states and other levels working together because we can each implement this in different level. We can implement what we are doing in our partnership in EU policies because we are in the working groups and we are creating EU policies as member states. Uh, so back to Espon. <laughs> Uh, so uh, um, uh, the case studies, uh, more information on, on data that we are missing and maybe more guidance in uh, how we can improve our policies as well. Uh, adding to that, <coughs> I, I agree with Janja, but I, the, the, the point that, that, that Carlos was making earlier, uh, that there is this gap uh, between, let's say, national level and uh, a local level and regional level um, is th there is there is not sufficient um, qu quality of data. I, I interpret it like, like like that, and that that's I think that's something that we could uh, invest in. And one example is uh, transparency. If you t if you take for example uh, the case for recycling, uh, Carlos is absolutely right when he says that um, a lot of what is being labeled as recycling uh, in, the, in, the, in the statistics is not really recycling. Uh, a lot of it is going to landfill, a lot of it is going to, uh, to incineration. Um, and what we need is more transparency in the whole chain. I mean, that's one of the things that we asked, for example, in our new waste management contracts uh, to give us some transparency in the recycling chain, and we just could not get it. So we cannot report back uh, to our city council, for example, what is exactly ha happening with that plastic bottle that is being collected, which citizens are really making an effort to hold them apart and to, uh, to have them separately collected. We cannot tell the story. And I think that we need more data, more uh, uh, statistics to tell the story and to tell the actual and the real story. Um, I want when uh, what's at the beginning of all these processes of a circular economy? Is that a political choice? And if it is, um, is that really important to measure us, to measure all this process? Is it a political choice? Mm. Yes, yes and no. Um, you, you always need some, at, at least I can only speak for, for, for the case of The Hague, um, where uh, circular economy was a political choice in the sense that it was initiated by a, a city council, but without knowing what it was all about, without realizing what impact that this could have. Um, and so we found ourselves as uh, as, a citizen, as as, 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 as um, civil servants with the task of developing the argument of a local circular economy. Uh, and 
we had to do that in the most tangible way possible. And for a city, the most tangible way possible at the moment is to take your waste management and to see if you can contribute to the circular economy by making that transition to more resource and value-oriented uh, uh, system. Um, which is not co saying that you cannot uh, do something about consumption and things like that, but I mean, like production, uh, uh, product design, those are things that are far from the influence of, uh, of a city council. So I think that the, we, we have to give them the material to work with, and I think that that is the material that the politicians can work with, at least in my city. About the national point of view, or for um, uh, us, of course, it was similar, like uh, Jan Hako said, uh, it was at the beginning um, just the initiative by the ministry. Uh, but what is the most important is uh, to have uh, really strong drivers and also to build trust. And now it is important that now it became a political decision. And that is also important because this is increasing the trust, especially in trust of companies, how they do develop and also is uh, also contributing in charge to the people's behavior. And um, um, with this, uh, wait, I wanted to say something else. <laughs> now I forgot. Okay, thank you, Yanya. We, so we're reaching the end of this um, of this workshop, but maybe you have one or two questions that our panelists could try to to answer, if there are any. Thank you. Um, uh, okay. No. Um, now listening to to the presentations, I have uh, in principle uh, two observations. One is, um, I think there is quite a difference between what what uh, Lucas Porsche said uh, between marketable and non-marketable uh, processes. Because um, I think the circular economy, if we think now about the the big streams of uh, material streams. This uh, actually concerns the marketable goods, when, whereas what you can do in your small environment, uh, it, it, it's more the non-marketable, where we have a very strong social dimension. I think a lot of that, what's happening there with the co-repair and, and so on, that was happening in families 100 years ago, or in, 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 in villages, or... Um, uh, I was just, um, yeah, I had this impression that actually we are um, substituting some functions which have been taken over by the so society, whereas when it's about this marketable, um, then um, we have to consider that uh, one of the big problems of circular economy is to have the information flow, to have the network, the infrastructure, uh, because if it would be uh, goods which uh, would be traded on markets, then it it would work. But it's for some reason not traded on, on, on the market because the transaction costs are too high. And then we have uh, we have to recognize that, and then we have to think more what what's actually missing. I mean, wh what's the the part, I mean, like having bourses, uh, having, I mean, like you say, in, in uh, Airbnb, uh, there is somebody who puts up uh, internet, so the, it, it's, it's ba basically about uh, getting consumers with producers mm. together in a very easy and simple way. So uh, this I just wanted to highlight because I think that's very important when we think about measures to Easy to support these processes that we have to in mind. What 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 are we actually talking about? Is it marketable, or what's the objective, or is it more also a kind of social component which never will be selling? Thank you. Yes. Uh, Yes, exactly. I think um, th this is an, an important component. Uh, I would say um, with the marketable, non-marketable, the, the transaction cost argument you mentioned is quite important because in, in a way the, the, the collaborative economy approaches can be a solution to, uh, especially to the, to in, in waste streams for if the collection, a part of the transaction cost, are if, you ha if it's all small, ma small, um, small volumes that you have to collect together, and in some cases, um, collaborative economy approaches can 
basically e uh, help with that problem. So you wouldn't find a company doing all this collection and bringing it all together and then using the waste because it's not um, a, th there is not enough margin in it. But you find a, a volunteers network in some ways that that can do the same trick. So. I said there can be an addition to that. Obviously, they are not the solution for every. Uh, they're, they're not the solution for everything. But in very specific cases, they can, they can, they can support um, um, the over the overall framework and uh, and uh, understanding what is the problem here. Why is yeah, and, th and that's very old economic thinking in in a way. Is what is the problem? What what is the the market um, failure? That why does the market doesn't provide it? And then looking at, um, um, and, and then you have a lot of the solution already. Why is, could this approach be working? And but um, uh, that's that's an important way of thinking about it. Yeah. Thank you. Can we take uh, maybe last last question and quick answer, and to let you also all go for for a short coffee break. Thank you very much. Let us start the chance to ask something. So um, I would like to bring it back that we were talking about also the urban agenda. And um, we heard several things. We heard several times the ter term that we had need a systemic transformation or systemic change. Now we are talking about the urban context. We have also we have a strong interlock of the physical fabric, social fabric, administration, and so on. Most of the examples that I heard were like um, it somewhere in the niches. It's were incremental things, and if you have things that are really interruptive, then you have something like Airbnb, which really collides with all the social system, with the physical fabric, actually. Um, like, what kind of support would you need that you get to this kind of systemic change and transformation in this kind of physical social fabric that has been growing for thousands of years, partly? You're asking for disruptive ideas, and I think that, that there are a lot of people who have a lot of disruptive ideas. Um, I'm moving away a bit from the social, uh, from the social economy, I remember uh, w at one point in the partnership we were talking about waste legislation and waste definitions and um, the, 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 the way that we uh, would like to change waste definitions in order to m get a more value-based approach into the reuse of, of waste materials. And uh, there were a lot of red flags that were being raised by, let's say, the usual suspects within the waste sector. Um, so that is already quite a disruptive idea, although when logically thinking or, or, or common sense thinking, you would say you need to make that shift from risk-based approach to a value-based approach. But, uh, so, so, but, but that is already, seeing all the red flags going up, already a very disruptive uh, uh, idea. Uh, another one, um, and that, that is, has always been, in my view, a bit of the, the, the elephant in the room uh, within the partnership, is how can member states uh, support this whole exercise with uh, fiscal uh, and tax measures? Um, with, you, you need some quite disruptive ideas about, uh, tax, uh, about taxation and about, uh, 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 about, about financing in order to support this whole development, for example. And I think that there are enough ideas, but it has to become more mainstream in our way of thinking. Thank you very much, everybody. I think we need to, uh, to, to, to stop here, <laughs> although I guess you might have had a lot of uh, different other questions. Thank you very much for, um, for being with us uh, this morning. We are coming back in 15 minutes with a kind of wrap-up sessions where you will see all the different representatives of the partnerships that have been discussing in the other workshops also uh, to give us uh, also their, their, their feedback to back about all that. So please uh, enjoy your coffee break and let's be back here at 10 o'clock. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Now that our panel is complete, I welcome you all again uh, to the session that aims at presenting the main results uh, of the workshops that we just had this morning. And uh, as you know, uh, the aim of these workshops was to identify the synergies and the potential contribution that ESPON uh, can, can, uh, can uh, offer uh, to support the work of uh, the urban partnerships uh, and also to support the implementation 
of uh, the different actions of the urban action plans that have been uh, uh, agreed within the urban partnerships. Uh, and today uh, we would like to hear uh, some results of the discussions uh, from this morning uh, from the representatives uh, 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 of uh, four uh, partnerships. Uh, so we have uh, a representative of Urban Agenda Partnership on the Digital Transition from the University of Oli Oulu, Mr. Petri Ahogangas, uh, welcome. Uh, then we also have uh, a representative from the Urban Agenda Partnership on Circular Economy from the Municipality of Hague, uh, Jan Hanko Post, uh, also a welcome. Uh, then we have Elena, uh, Elena Zolgayova from the Urban Partnership on Housing from the Ministry of Transport, Construction and Regional Development. Uh, also, welcome uh, to the panel. And then we have uh, Angelika Potmogele. Uh, she's representing the Partnership on Energy Transition and also will uh, we'll, uh, uh, report to us on the results of, uh, of the, that discussion. So welcome everybody. I hope, uh, I hope you all had an exciting uh, morning and then let's uh, hear uh, shortly from uh, uh, the workshops and the, and the main results. So, colleagues, uh, we have uh, um, two main questions uh, to discuss today and also to hear from you. And maybe we leave the third uh, in case if we have uh, sufficient time also to uh, follow up uh, on this discussion. So, the first question that I would like to ask you uh, is uh, how uh, do you see uh, the results of the ESPAN projects that we heard about, that you heard about this morning, can support uh, the actions uh, of the partnerships based on what you learned uh, this morning? Can you uh, share with us uh, your insights? Maybe we can start with Elena. Well, I expect it to be the fours, and I hope that then I will adapt what I'm going to say to what, what, what would be said uh, by the other partners. Anyhow, uh, no problem. Uh, we came uh, from the housing partnership to the meeting and uh, to discussion of two ESPON projects to try to find uh, how our work and our actions addressing data, urban data, affordability data, housing uh, uh, detail uh, information about housing data, how can be linked to the work of ESPAN? And what we found actually in the presentation of two projects was that in Europe, we are missing elementary basic data on everything. And the housing is not an exception. Uh, what we need, we need to harmonize and we, we need to agree which kind of data we need to have on European, national, regional, and local level, who is going to do that, and how we understand the terms of this data, because there is a huge misunderstanding across Europe in there. And we saw from the projects that when data are available, and very often it is a very uh, complicated process to get these necessary data, a lot of very inspiring and uh, smart projects can be prepared. We heard in the, in the project of big data how combining traditional and not traditional data plus big data can give a very dynamic picture of what is happening on the city level. But again, it was only some cases because even if the group of the researchers doing on this, uh, on this project were relatively big. It was not in capacity, in a human capacity, an expert capacity, to collect necessary data, necessary for doing this research and coming with conclusions. And what in our partnership we say, we don't have this element of data in Europe. We need to call, call for them, and we need to have the partners who are going to support the partnership actions in really getting this. It is a question of Eurostat, it is a question of different DGs in Europe, it is a question of national statistical offices, it is a question of different research units, which are GRC, ESPAN, uh, urban platform, to sit together to discuss at least for two days what do we have on data, in our case on housing, and related to housing. 
and to agree how we proceed further that we can really have in the future comparable data which really give the technically correct picture of what is happening in this area. And um, what, uh, where we see this uh, possible cooperation. I think that the, the funny uh, outcome of our discussion in our group, in our workshop, was that it would be useful if ESPON would take and would really do a research on 100 years of housing policy development across Europe. And this might then help to really to look also on data from to totally different angle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Now let's hear from the Urban Partnership on Secular Economy. Mr. Post, can you share with us uh, how do you see the results of the projects that you have heard about this morning support the work of the Urban Partnership and also how you see ESPON could further contribute to the uh, implementation of the uh, urban uh, action plan that you have agreed upon? Well, for, first of all, I, I, I think that what's, what's just being said, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that was one of the findings of, of our workshop as well, that there are a lot of missing data, uh, the wrong data, some, uh, sometimes very uh, difficult to combine data in the right way, to interpret them in the right way. So. I the, the point that you are making is absolutely very valid. Um, in addition to that, uh, for circular economy, um, we rely on a lot of data at the moment that are more or less that or more or less originate in what we call the linear economy. Uh, we all know how to measure GDP. We all know how to measure growth. We all know how to measure uh, jobs, etc. But what we're less used to doing is measure impact and especially impact uh, on local economies and impact on, on, uh, on, on regional economies in terms of social inclusion, in terms of uh, sustainability, in terms of responsibility. And I think there is an enormous, uh, 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 enormous array of data to be gathered there and, 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 and a lot of research and understanding to be gathered there uh, in order to uh, support the fundamentals of a circular economic development, which is in essence an impact economy and also a social economy. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting to hear that you had uh, quite similar conclusions also from your workshops. Uh, what can you say from uh, the workshop on the energy transition, Angelica, do you also share the same conclusions or maybe you have something else to add to that uh, debate on uh, the potential contribution of ESPON uh, to yeah. the work of Urban Agenda Partnerships? We did not talk about data. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we talked about uh, research, about studies in particular. It was interesting to see that studies that have been produced a couple of years ago are still relevant, but the question is, did anybody pay attention to the results? In particular, in this case, we were targeting uh, DG Radio in the European Commission. Apparently, they even removed the report from their website because they are not so happy with the result. <laughs> but that was uh, just a side uh, comment. So the question is, the advantage of, or our conclusion was the advantage of the ESPAN studies is that they are cross-sectoral. They cover a lot of different elements which are important for the question and in, re in, in relation to our topic energy, looking at uh, energy consumption on, uh, in, in transportation, in buildings, in, uh, in, 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 in heating, cooling, etc. So ESPON has the advantage of going cross-sectoral, whereas we found it a bit difficult or negative even that the partnerships and the urban partnerships are very sectoral. So we understand that the partnership on energy transition was not allowed, let's put it like that, to talk about mobili mobility. I'm not sure whether they were allowed to talk about housing, building, but that the partnerships were very sectoral and uh, were not really uh, allowed to think about uh, out, of, out of the box, whereas we think the ESPAN studies are have the advantage of being broader, of tackling uh, an issue from, from all uh, different areas. But still, the, uh, the the very important issue for the urban uh, agenda uh, approach is this multi multi level governance approach. So to say, all relevant actors uh, of uh, of the different um, 
um, level of governance, so the European, the national, uh, and, the, and the local level is involved. So this is something that we see also, uh, if I may touch already on the territorial agenda, the governance issue is, is an important one, which is needs to be addressed, which stays important on the on the on the uh, in the discussion and is also reflected in the in the Espen uh, studies. But maybe it should be a bit uh, more in the forefront. Not forgetting that we need to address all the different areas, a uh, different dimension of sustainable development, social, <coughs> environmental, economy, and for us the uh, the governance issue in, in in particular. Yeah, I would like leave to leave it here. Thank you. Thank you, Angelika. Uh, indeed, uh, one of the advantages of the ESPEN program is that in our research we touch upon quite many horizontal subjects uh, that are related to planning, to governance, to uh, investment, uh, and also uh, different aspects of sustainable uh, territorial development. And this is also how we see we can also further contribute to the work of the urban partnerships to make sure that they are not only, as you say, thematic and, and sectoral, but they also can relate to these cross-thematic and horizontal issues and, and to see how to address the governance challenges, how to also uh, better design some governance solutions uh, for the different topics uh, that are in question. Yes, so thank you very much for this observation. Uh, and then we move on to the uh, Urban Partnership on the Digital Transition. Are there any additional insights that you would like to share or you can maybe uh, uh, join uh, some, uh, some previous conclusions? Mm. Maybe I could say that the, the way how we were discussing in our pa d discussions was more holistic and service oriented. So data is just one en en enabler for these services that we might have. And digital transition is a ho overwhelming thing that goes over all sectors and functions of the cities and the municipalities in practice. So that is a fundamental difference. And the, the research that we were hearing were about how do we co-create these services together with the businesses and the NGOs and the citizens together. That would be one angle. And then we were hearing about the research on the regional level, that how different regions are technology producing, maybe technology utilize, utilizing, and uh, then about the spillover effects of these uh, different technical uh, technological transformations that we are seeing in different places. So uh, maybe the, the lesson was that if we are to combine that kind of things into the practice, the implementation, from my perspective, especially because I'm coming from the business model thinking, would be that cities need business models to transform their services uh, so that they really add value to the citizens and to the companies that are working within the uh, within the cities or within the regions in practice. So we were discussing about that kind of uh, holistic uh, phenomena that we see uh, at the societal level. But if we want to go into implementation of these strategies that we have, then the question is about that how to make the cities see the, the way how digitalization uh, is done by the businesses where the business model thinking uh, guides everything and maybe there is room for cities to adopt uh, their own business model thinking that they can utilize in this kind of transition thank you very much for your insight uh, and uh, we very much hope that also in the future espon can uh, contribute to the work uh, of your partnerships uh, we still have a bit of time so maybe let's have a quick uh, second round and if there's one thing that you would like ESPON to do in the future to support better the work of your ob urban partnership, what this one thing would be? Uh, I'm going to be rather provocative. Uh, there were 12 very important topics picked up in 2016, and they are lasting to 21. Uh, from the technical aspects of the uh, lifespan of partnership, they exist for three years. They gather experts from all the partners, really from local level, from national level, from the DGs, it means commission, from other relevant partners. In three years, they come together with an action plan, which actually formulates what should be done 
to have a better regulation, better financing, and better knowledge. In all the partnerships which already has finished, have finished, and in those who are going to finish, there is always a set of actions which need to be fulfilled. The activities of other partners who were not the partners of the, of the partnership, the members of the partnership. It needs activity on the side of the Commission, of the Parliament, and of other European bodies. And ESPON can be very helpful in keeping these open actions alive and asking all relevant partners in the broader European scene to contribute to their implementation. Thank you. That's uh, quite an ambitious uh, task for ESPON, I have to say, for the future, but I'm sure we would be able to uh, cope with that as well. And uh, definitely, uh, Urban Agenda is also one of our policy frameworks and, 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 and policy um, processes that uh, we aim uh, to support in the future. From your side, one thing that you would like ESPON to do in the future to support better the work of your partnership? Um. More, more, more or less, more or less the same answer. Um, but I, I already s said it previously that I think for um, Espon could very, very, very well contribute to all the action, all the post partnership actions. As you said, our partnership ends this year. We're going to have a debate uh, next week in Brussels on how we want to proceed. Uh, especially on the number of actions that we feel have not finished yet uh, because we lack uh, 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 no, uh, we still lack knowledge or there is still um, a, a certain procedure to follow for example on on legislation actions um, but I think especially on the knowledge side uh, with, with with prolonging the knowledge actions that we have I, th I think that Espon can be key uh, to support us in that to further carrying further these, these, these actions, not only the current action on, on the collaborative economy and the sharing economy, but also a number of other knowledge actions that we have and that ESPON has not yet been involved in. We're happy, We're happy to do so. Let's stay in touch. Thank you. Angelica, uh, your requests to ESPON. Yeah, I think we should have the ambition to walk in the same direction um, now in the in the situation that we will have the new cohesion policy hopefully being uh, adopted by the end of next year and starting with the implementation i think we should all have the ambition to transform or to translate the findings of the urban agenda of the uh, studies from from espon into concrete action so not just having these very useful studies and recommendations and action plans somewhere in the in the drawer and just access accessible to a small number of of people who know about it but really translating it into concrete programs into concrete actions what where do we go from here because otherwise it's it's a, it's a lost opportunity you invest so much energy money uh, expertise in developing these really very important papers but if nobody picks them up and puts them into something concrete it's it's a pity and i think we cannot afford i speak on the f on behalf of the of the energy transition group now and we see the clear link of course also with climate change we cannot afford not to capitalize the knowledge that has been achieved also in the relevant uh, ESPON studies. So I think we should really put some pressure uh, in the coming weeks and months to say use the knowledge, use the expertise that has been collected uh, and let's continue uh, in translating that into concrete action. Thank you very much. You had an additional remark. To, to add to that, um, we as a partnership, we, we have a, a lot of ideas have, have come out of our partnership. And one of the things that we want to do in the next few months and years, even years, is to test drive and prototype some of these ideas. And in testing and prototyping these ideas, I think that Aspen could, ve could, could also fulfill a very valuable role in uh, walking with us on that and traveling with us on that and generating uh, the data and generating the knowledge uh, that, that, that Aspen can then use again to translate into other uh, uh, policy areas and policy recommendations. Thank you very much. Let's do so. And then finally, your final request for Aspen. 
Mm, yeah, I think that I continue with what my colleagues here started. I think that ESPAN would go more opportunity oriented and act upon the opportunities. For example, there is a very huge opportunity coming for the cities uh, in the next couple of years, and that's the 5G networks, because in the future there will be local networks that cities could run. Now the question is that in which cities, with what kind of services, that would be actually feasible and practical and would enhance digital transition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, before we move on to the next session, uh, I can uh, open up for three minutes for a question or a feedback from the audience. Is there anything that we need to hear from the audience, from the group discussions? Uh, any additional ideas how ESPON is, can, should be useful to the work of the urban partnerships? Three, two, one, no reflection. Uh huh. Good. Sometimes it's good to, be, to put some pressure Thank on you. people. Uh, no, I <laughs> actually, uh, there's something, um, I don't know if it's possible, but I was thinking uh, from our experience working together with from different type of <coughs> stakeholders that if there would be a way that ESPON could be, or we could find a way to form a cooperation uh, in uh, when you said, you know, be with us on this journey it means working together, not just commissioning a project. If that would be possible to find this way, that would be, I think, very beneficial. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think it's a good idea. Maybe we could uh, become also um, um, a permanent member of uh, one or two partnerships just to test the approach to start with, and then uh, we see how we could develop this model for the future. And we have one more contribution. Yeah, uh, I don't know if ESPON can do something, but one big issue for researchers is the fact that a lot of big data and very important data for research are owned by private companies. And we have to buy from them the data to do research on flows coming from our mobile phone. So I don't know if ESPON could push <laughs> to do something on this, because this data should be uh, public and, and then with some regulations on how to use them. It is, I think it is really uh, terrible that we have to buy them, our data, we have to buy them from private companies to research. Thank you. Indeed, uh, big data is uh, one new field of, uh, of uh, research of our work as well within ESPON, and we have uh, a number of activities that have been already completed, and we will be launching a new one uh, to also explore further opportunities to use b big data for evidence production and for policy development. And whenever we will have new evidence in-house, in uh, of course, we will make it public and also through that, uh, we can also support further activities uh, of our research uh, network. So thank you very much for this comment. And we have one more here. Thank you, Mr. Mar Marko Malby from the Regional Council of Hame here in Southern Finland. And I really like what Ms. Paul Mögele said about then the how we could implement these results and then this beautiful research, what ESPON does. Uh, I myself work for the regional government and I really have to say that then the results and then the, uh, this research and everything is pretty, un we are pretty unaware. Uh, we, are, we don't know this uh, on the regional level, how we could use and uh, it is not this kind of common language we use then so using ESPON uh, research then so for our purposes for practical uh, uh, practical daily daily work and I think this kind of awareness campaign or uh, you maybe should find a way how to make this uh, this capacity building and as aware of your work what you do in Espon. Thank you very much for, for this comment. Indeed, uh, this is also what I is, uh, how I started the, the seminar is uh, the, the main message is that for us, outreach definitely and capitalization of our, our, our evidence is, is a key challenge and also a long-term uh, endeavor. And we need to find new ways how to reach out to regional local players to make them aware of ESPON evidence, to encourage them to use it. But I also said that we cannot do it alone. So now that you've been here, 
you automatically also become our ambassador. <laughs> so please, when you come back uh, to, to your place, to your hometown, to your work, please use that opportunity also to tell people about our work, to tell about our results, to encourage them to use it and to send them back to us if they have any further questions. And this applies to everybody here in this room, to everybody who has ever participated uh, in, in the work of ESPON. This was my key message also from, from, uh, from the morning. With the EGTC resources alone, we cannot cover the whole Europe. We cannot go everywhere. We cannot be present and visible everywhere. So this is why we need you, people who know ESPON, who know our evidence, who are encouraged, uh, who are inspired and informed and uh, are ready to also support our work. So I would very much appreciate also to hear back from you how you uh, succeeded. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, colleagues, thank you very much for your feedback, for your insight, and also for your further requests uh, to, to our work in the future. We very much appreciate that. And uh, with this, I would like to close this session and we move on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Before moving forward to the last sessions of our seminar, I would like to invite on stage two our colleagues, Gavin and Piera, who will share with you a short but important message on behalf of the ESPN EGTC team. Please welcome them. Thank you, Nicolas. Hi, everybody. Well, we are uh, at the end of uh, 2019, a very busy year for, uh, for us, but also a tough one, because in January, our friend and colleague, sorry, come. Our friend and colleague, Peter Billing, passed away. And we would like to remember him with his smiling face and positivity here because uh, Scandinavia, Scandinavia was uh, his homeland. We have received a lot of messages from the Espon family and uh, we would like to thank you all for this. Thank you. As you all know, uh, Peter's contribution to Espon has been instrumental in developing the ESPON network and contributing to the success that ESPON is today. And I think his, his natural humor and kindness brought people together, no matter what their cultural background was. And we know that knowing how respected and regarded Peter was and the very many messages that we received uh, was, was a great comfort to his wife, Mary, and uh, his daughter, Amelia. But even before uh, joining ESPON, Peter was an accomplished author in his own right, uh, particularly on is issues of social justice, which shone through his kindness and his personality. He wrote books about the growth of the workers' uh, movement and development of the People's Park in Malmo, the impact of uh, dem the demolitions on low-income communities during the 1960s and 1970s, and the social development of Malmo in the 1990s. But he had a wide range of e issues, did our Peter. He was a great lover of sport, and music, particularly heavy metal. ACDC was his favorite t-shirt to wear around the office. And uh, he wrote, even wrote a book about the, uh, in 1996, which is available on the Malmo Sports History site, 100 Years of Community, and it's a, it's a real work of art. People should check it out. And it's a testament to his breadth and interest that he even wrote a book about Swedish football. Peter was a, a football, uh, addict and I will miss uh, his Monday morning chats about the weekend's football results and uh, uh, the various sports results over the weekend. Um, I, think we w I think I speak for all our colleagues in the ESPON EGCC that we'd be all uh, forever grateful for his friendship, his personal friendship and his professional friendship. Indeed, it was during the 2013 um, Irish Presidency of the European Council that uh, Peter tapped me on the shoulder and said there was a job going in ESPON, <laughs> which is the reason why I'm here today. And I think that epitomizes Peter. He was always looking out for people to give them the next step in their career, and, and he was, had a particular interest in, in, in the ESPON internship program to give young uh, researchers their first step on the uh, career ladder. Um, yesterday, Pierre was in a bookshop, and I think uh, she found an inspiring quote 
which is on the screen behind us, I think which sums up and epitomizes Peter's character. And I think it's an important thing for us to reflect on as practitioners in cohesion policy and European solidarity, that uh, the interests which we share as human beings are far more powerful than the force that drives us apart. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Gavin, thank you, Piera. So this seminar is coming to, to its end and um, to move forward and to look forward uh, uh, and before bidding you also farewell and a safe return, we will now learn about the progress of the activities of uh, ESPON 2020 cooperation program this year and also insight about um, 2020 next year. And uh, we'll also learn about uh, the key thematic priorities for both the Croatian and the German presidencies. So please, uh, for this, I would like to invite uh, to the stage Timo Eze. Timo is here from Espon Managing Authority and also Sandra Momcilovic, Espon Monitoring Committee member from Croatia, Volker, Volker Schmidt, Seivert Espon Contact Point from Germany and the two last, you know them already very well. Please Ilona, come on stage for the Espony GTC and also Joanna Rotianen from the Finnish Presidency. Well, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity also to give some messages uh, from uh, the monitoring committee and uh, about the state of the progress of the program and also what are the perspectives um, we are looking at uh, in the preparation of the next programming period. And I mean, it was interesting also to hear uh, what the expectations are, what the wishes are to the ESPON, and I think I can say that uh, the thoughts which are uh, uh, discussed uh, uh, in the monitoring committee, but also um, at the joint working group, which prepares for the next programming period, um, are covering quite a range of the comments which have been made. But before we talk about that, just some general insights about the current program where we stand. And uh, I think in the opening, you saw already that we are now uh, taking much attention towards the dissemination, the outreach to involve, um, uh, to involve journalists in, uh, in our work. And uh, this is also a consequence of the fact that we have been already uh, finishing a lot of the applied research project, a lot of activities we are, and you see that also in the workshops, we have a lot to tell. Uh, and now we have to make sure that uh, this also reaches the audience. And when we look about uh, at the uh, indicators, what we use at the program level, you can actually say regarding the output, we are nearly there, um, we, we have implemented nearly all applied research projects. We have the targeted analysis, which are launched uh, nearly all of them. We have thematic focus papers, and this is part of the outreach where we have still uh, quite some uh, uh, space uh, to uh, be active. Um, the third, uh, that's the third um, uh, column, if you like. F Espon tools created and ongoing, we are working. Um, but what the good news I think is that we were very active on the side of outreach events. And uh, I think it's good to see that we actually go beyond the original ambitions and what, what, what we hear from your side here, it's, uh, it's also the message we have to, we should go and uh, that we have to uh, not stop now. We have enough to tell, 
we have to uh, enough to uh, publish so um, we will not stop now and take this as uh, as uh, as we, we 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 reach our targets and um, that's also a bit technical but um, i hope you can read it but that's how structural funds work we need to uh, work within a performance framework um, uh, we uh, have to define uh, baseline values uh, we have to um, to um, to measure how far we are reaching this by baseline values and i don't want to go now in detail because some is overlapping but what was uh, most striking for me the last baseline value what we had um, that um, there was in uh, at the end of the last programming period some dissatisfaction with the uh, implementation provisions of the program that we are far better off now. And I think that's a good news. That's also an important news uh, for the work on the future program uh, in order to improve um, uh, uh, the implementation of uh, provision of the program. And that relates a lot to, to also to the researchers. Now, um, Ilona will talk about what we plan for the next year, but I mean, as the monitoring committee and the joint working group for the future program is having the broader perspective, I will say some words um, in that regard. Now, uh, where is ESPON placed in the intervention logic of the European Territorial Cooperation Regulation? You know that uh, the structural funds regulation actually underlines the importance of governance. I think that was one of the l uh, lessons which was learned from uh, the uh, uh, current and the previous programming period that um, we need to spend money for cohesion on project on infrastructure innovative activities, but we can do better uh, in spending it in the right place. And, and this is one of the mes messages also taking into account that uh, um, the funds will be reduced due to uh, Brexit, the availability of funds. So um, if we have less money, we have to make an effort to spend it in the right place, in the efficient way. And um, this is also where uh, then uh, Interreg is uh, coming in, that uh, the objective for Interreg is uh, to support the management of specific territories and implement territorial strategies. Exactly to have a clear idea why we spend money where and for which purpose. And in that framework, uh, ESPON is placed uh, where uh, the regulation proposed by the commission and as far as we can see, it's not touched uh, in, in, in the trialogues. Where ESPON's uh, specific objective is the promotion of the analysis of development trends in relation to the aims of territorial cohesion. So promotion in red, so it's not only doing the evidence, but also to promote it. And what you are saying uh, to us uh, yesterday in the opening session and what we hear now from uh, urban partnerships and so on, um, it's exactly um, the way we are now also thinking. So we had some inputs from the midterm evaluation. We should do more efforts uh, towards the regional local policy makers. We should also better involve scientists and stimulate debates. And I think this format of bringing stakeholders together and having a more like uh, dialogue format of exchange rather than putting presentations uh, in front of a bigger audience is uh, pointing exactly at this um, uh, <coughs> direction to have a more strategic approach to reach our target groups, uh, more specialized outputs, more communicative ways of uh, um, delivering um, the evidence and uh, to identify the specific needs of the target groups. So when we put that together, then we understand that we are not only talking about evidence production, but to help people to acquire the knowledge. 
And this is now the way how we discuss it in the joint working group, that um, we have to take better care of how all this evidence is further used in a particular political context, how it will be applied. And we have to think in a more strategic way how we actually integrate that in our knowledge production. The evidence is not only facts and figures, but knowledge is, means actually that the people can use it, they are in the position to use it. So the strategy for the next programming period is now ranging around these two basic elements. Of course, the evidence production, that's the home base, that's our, our brand, if you like, uh, for the ESCON, to produce territorial evidence in a well-defined framework. We can uh, better target the research uh, selected on a systematic needs assessment, but uh, to also think in an integrative way how then uh, we can combine knowledge development activities um, so that the policymakers can uh, gain ownership uh, uh, towards the evidence which is produced. So, and this was then the approach that we say, okay, ESPON, we have these two elements which have to be very well linked, evidence production, but we point at policy makers, policy enablers, that's the ones who are in administration in, uh, uh, in all the support which is given to uh, policy um, are involved there, but we also should uh, better target scientists and research and um, uh, upgrade the attention within uh, the ESPON at that side, because um, in comparison to the previous programming period, um, in this programming period, the scientists and research were secondary target group, and we learned now that we have to move them one step up. So to summarize, this approach is, means actually that ESPON is successful only if two conditions are met, necessary conditions, useful territorial evidence is produced, and the sufficient condition is that the evidence is promoted and used in policy making. So what does that mean? I mean, in the evidence production, we have to better understand what type of evidence is to be produced. Um, is there already something there in the field? I mean, Lambert van Nistelrooy was mentioning that, yes, we are not working only as ESPON, but there is a lot out in the field, and we can make much more out of our limited resources if we better take care of what's on the market already and we complement our activities. So we are actually uh, recognizing much better or much more targeted um, who are the other players, what are they producing, and how can we complement and put value added on that. The same is, I mean, if we talk about certain support to policy processes, what type of analysis do we need? Do we need policy impact assessment? Do we need uh, some specific data collection? Um, what is actually coming out of the demand uh, of uh, the policy from the policy side? Then um, this is very much connected with the types of needs from which sector, which target group, in which time frame. So this is also related uh, with the fact what kind of evidence we can deliver at what time uh, at a specific place. And finally, um, we also have to talk about the geographical scope. When we look at all the case studies, which I, it's interesting to see that when it's especially coming to policy advice, it's very important to have case studies where we can actually demonstrate good practice and uh, uh, the, what can be learned out of that. We have to uh, make sure that the territorial and geographical focus is widespread, that we have examples from different types of regions, and that we concentrate actually 
on the territorial dimension because this is what we can add to the sectoral one. The sectoral is very well covered. The commission uh, proposed that in the regulation uh, sectoral policy objective, but here is the place, I mean, where we, uh, where we have to territorialize it and where all the different sectors are falling together on the territory. Finally, when we talk about knowledge development, I mean, we, it was mentioned yesterday and I was <laughs> very happy that we, I had it already in the slide. So talking about push measures, I mean, we deliver, ESPON gets active from, uh, uh, from our side, we are going out uh, showing what, uh, what, uh, what we can, uh, what we have uh, found and try from our side to bring that to the policy makers. But on the other side, we also talk about pull measures. I mean, attracting the interest of <coughs> all type of stakeholders by directly involving them in activities. I mean, this learning policy labs, uh, this kind of measures um, where they attract them um, the um, um, evidence and uh, use it and create ownership. And then a third type of uh, knowledge development would be than to accompany stakeholders in their process of taking up and using evidence. And I think this urban partnerships are a good example and we know that in the territorial agenda, we're talking about partnerships, um, we talk about giving support to the implementation, the preparation implementation of um, operational programs within cohesion policy, so there are many ways of accompanying this kind of policy processes. So this is just a, a, a small insight in uh, what uh, we discuss at the level of the joint working group to have really a framework and intervention logic developed. So the group plans to meet for four times uh, in the year 2020. Um, we will also uh, have a bigger event uh, on the 18th March 2020 with stakeholders in Brussels. We will send out the invitations soon where we, based on the results which we have achieved with some very example, simplified projects, discuss how we can further develop this approach. And then, of course, as uh, this is foreseen for the um, structural funds in any case, uh, we will have a comprehensive uh, stakeholder consultation on the cornerstones of the future program in the course of 2020. The timing, of course, depends on the progress which is made with regard to the decisions on the uh, European uh, Structural and Investment Fund regulation. The MFF, of course, for the ESPON, this is also a very important element because we can fix the last priorities within the program only once we know our budget and we have sorted with uh, our member states and partner states uh, the co-financing. So that will then most probably be more at the end of 2020. This is what I wanted to share with you and I will update you the next time uh, on the further development. Thank you. Good morning again. Um, let me now uh, inform you briefly on the progress of the implementation of uh, the single operation, uh, where we stand and uh, what the next year uh, will bring in terms of uh, new activities that we foresee uh, to implement. Um, let me start with some information on uh, our achievements. Uh, so, uh, so far uh, in the previous months since the last seminar, uh, we have uh, completed uh, a number of uh, applied research activities, so there's uh, new evidence in-house. The mountain of gold is becoming bigger and bigger. 
and now we have added uh, five uh, applied research results uh, to this mountain, uh, one on financial instruments and territorial cohesion, uh, another one on circular economy and territorial consequences uh, on territories with geographical specificities, green infrastructures, and uh, the territorial reference uh, framework. All these are very comprehensive studies containing a lot of data, analysis, uh, case studies, policy recommendations, um, handbooks, policy guides also to support uh, policy development and also to help policymakers to understand how to implement, for example, uh, green infrastructure or circular economy in, uh, in practice. So there is a, a wealth of uh, information, of, of data analysis and also uh, policy advice in each of these studies. So I encourage you really to uh, have a look at those and to find the most uh, appropriate piece uh, for yourselves. And uh, if you need any support, uh, any guidance also to help you to understand uh, how to navigate uh, through, the different, uh, through the different documents uh, of uh, each of those studies, please uh, let us know. Uh, one of the one of the big studies that we completed also uh, um, this year uh, recently and that was also presented during the European Week of Regions and Cities was the European Territorial Reference uh, Framework that highlighted uh, some of the key challenges that Europe is facing uh, nowadays and uh, will be facing in the future um, and uh, highlighted the fragmentation risks, the growing interdependencies among places and also the, the functional uh, mismatch between uh, administrative borders and, uh, and the real lives of people, so to say. Uh, and some of the key lessons that the study advocates for is uh, that the new territorialities will emerge beyond administrative uh, borders, that there is a pressure to reinvent democracy uh, through the society of uh, networks, and that sustainable and successful cooperation across Europe will require uh, a significant uh, shift. Uh, and uh, there are also some proposals for territorial agenda post-2020. As you know, at the moment, there is an ongoing intergovernmental uh, debate and uh, a process towards renewing the territorial uh, agenda. And this is uh, basically a key contribution. This project provided a very important contribution to the redesign of the uh, territorial agenda, uh, highlighting the need, um, as we discussed also yesterday, the need to promote more territorial cooperation, more functional approach looking beyond administrative borders, and also encouraging a bottom-up uh, visions, a bottom-up approach, uh, and uh, of course, within this uh, uh, thinking that uh, every, every place uh, needs uh, special attention and also a specific uh, approach and also a specific, a specifically designed strategy to support uh, its development. Uh, if we stay with the applied research, then uh, we'll be launching uh, two new applied research activities. At the moment, we are at the stage of the public procurement. We are finalizing our competitive dialogue procedures for two new applied research activities, one on interregional relations in Europe and the other one on cultural heritage as a sort of societal well-being in European regions. Um, with these new two activities, we are testing competitive dialogue as a new type of public procurement procedure. Uh, at the moment, it takes quite uh, quite a bit of time for us to implement it, but we believe that it will be beneficial for us because it gives an opportunity for us to engage the researchers, the potential service providers, in the discussion on the scope of these studies and also trying to see how to focus them, how to shape them, how to make sure that we can uh, that our researchers eventually can deliver results uh, according to the expectations of the uh, of the policy um, of the policy makers. So this is an interesting exercise for us, quite time consuming, uh, quite uh, quite demanding in, in terms of process. But at the same time, uh, we believe it, it really will bring benefit in terms of uh, increasing, further increasing the quality of evidence that eventually uh, will be delivered. We have also selected now in this period the last four targeted analyses that will be implemented in the framework of the, the current uh, program. So uh, in September 2019, we, we selected, uh, this year, we selected uh, four targeted analyses, one on quantitative greenhouse gas impact assessment method for spatial planning policy, where there will be 
um, an Irish uh, lead partner. Uh, then uh, we um, have selected another one uh, on sustainable transport infrastructure in strategic urban regions, uh, Euro Delta, where we'll have um, uh, lead partners, the uh, lead stakeholders coming from Netherlands. Then uh, another one on the role and future perspectives of cohesion policy in the strategic planning of metropolitan areas and cities, uh, with the metropolitan city of Turin as the lead stakeholder. And finally, there will be one uh, new targeted analysis on uh, the integrated development opportunities of large lakes in Europe, where we have uh, a Hungarian uh, partner as the, as the lead stakeholder uh, in, in this activity. So now we are at the stage of preparing public procurement procedures for these four uh, activities, and uh, then uh, um, by the end of this year, or rather probably at the beginning of, of next year, we will be then opening uh, calls to uh, submit uh, proposals for implementing these uh, activities. And then uh, an insight into the next year, we have discussed and agreed also with the monitoring committee that we will be implementing additional case studies uh, as spin-offs of ongoing or closed research. Uh, uh, this will be based on, on a set of selection criteria. We'll be uh, agreeing with the monitoring committee and also discussing with the researchers on the opportunities to implement additional case studies because, as Timo was also mentioning, for us it is very important that our research is relevant uh, to the national policymakers, to the regional policymakers, and that they really can use the results uh, in relation to their particular context. Uh, and this is why we believe that, uh, considering the, the availability of funds that we have, it is important for us to use this opportunity to make this research further uh, develop, uh, to further develop our research and also to further uh, develop our uh, pool of case studies that eventually we can use to help uh, people in different places to understand uh, possibilities to improve the quality of policy making in their countries. Then we also have um, uh, finalized and of course are still working on, on a number of activities uh, under the monitoring and tools uh, uh, part. Uh, one on big data and housing uh, has just been uh, completed. And this is one example uh, uh, that shows that also for ESPON, uh, big data is the subject that we have started exploring and we are trying to, to find uh, ways and also to explore opportunities to use big data in policy making. And here is one example in, in relation to, to housing. We have also engaged uh, in uh, the topic on sustainable development goals and uh, we will be uh, delivering some evidence uh, that will help to localize sustainable development goals. Here we will uh, be developing this, of course, in close cooperation with other uh, key partners who are involved in the, on, on this subject. We just kicked off recently this activity. And then um, we will also be uh, explore, exploring housing market dynamics in cross-border uh, areas. And cross-border areas uh, is also a very important uh, uh, kind of a scale of research for us and, and cross-border public services uh, also is uh, one subject that we will be working on also in the, uh, in the following years, considering that there is quite a strong interest from the policymakers, also from the Commission, to have additional evidence that can uh, support, uh, support this policy direction of further promoting uh, public service provision uh, and also other activities at the scale of, of cross-border areas. We will be also developing additional online tools also to support the, the uptake of our evidence and uh, help policymakers to work uh, with, uh, with our evidence. So we will be developing a tool for mapping uh, soft territorial cooperation areas. <laughs> I'm looking at Eric, who is the author of uh, the background research, our Actaria targeted analysis. Uh, and this proposal for a tool actually is a, is a, is a spin-off, is a follow-up uh, of the Actaria targeted analysis because the development of this tool was proposed uh, in this targeted analysis and we are now uh, at the stage of, of defining the, the terms of reference and we'll be launching this activity uh, quite soon again to give our um, to give our stakeholders, our policymakers an opportunity uh, to uh, use a tool that help them to identify the different players and also to identify potential cooperation areas. So this is one kind of small activity, but something that fits in the overall thinking of ESPON that we should promote 
thinking and action at the different functional geographical scales. Uh, and you can imagine different scales like cross-border, functional urban, uh, lakes, mountains, coastal areas, uh, whatever, wh wh all kinds of, of cooperation areas you can imagine. And this tool is, is one thing that can also help promote thinking and action and cooperation among players. Then we'll also be launching an, uh, an analytical tool for spatial comparisons and an online uh, mapping tool that can also, of course, uh, contribute to uh, some analytical uh, activities of uh, our uh, policy uh, makers. Um, this year, we were very active during the European Week of Regions and Cities. Uh, we managed to gather 1,155 participants. I'm looking at Piera, who was coordinating these activities. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we were we were involved involved in nine sessions as a lead partner, uh, and also in an eleven sessions as partners. Uh, and we also had a stand at the Agora, and we also were um, engaging you, our stakeholders, in what we call the ESPON talks, also to discuss the results of our research activities. And we made some short videos that we are now publishing everywhere. You probably have noticed also our increased uh, social network, uh, social activity on, on the social uh, media. Uh, and we are very happy with, uh, with this turnout and also with, uh, with this activity. And uh, uh, we believe that uh, the European Week of Regions and Cities also for us is a very important framework to make ourselves more visible and, and, and uh, ensure that uh, our stakeholders know about us at all scales and including regional and local. We're also working on our outreach activities at uh, transnational uh, scale and here we also have implemented a number of uh, interesting events. Um, there was the one in, in Slovakia on ESPON Open Data, there was a TIA training uh, in Denmark and Poland, there was also uh, an evidence uh, developed uh, on labour markets uh, for our Romanian colleagues and also an empirical input on functional areas in the uh, Czech uh, Republic. And we also have uh, uh, prepared a number of publications that you might consider interesting to look at, one on cross-border functional areas, another one on metropolitan functional areas. Then also we prepared a TIA guidance um, uh, for our stakeholders, and uh, there are two coming up. Uh, still in the framework of the current transnational outreach contract, one on assessing the net, net impact of Interreg, and the, one, uh, the other one on strategic niches for Interreg in cooperation with DG Grow, DG RTD, and uh, Interact. So in terms of uh, developing our publications, we have also been quite uh, active, and please have a look at our website and uh, make use of those if you find them interesting. Um, then uh, we will also be uh, continuing our transnational outreach activities in uh, uh, 2020, and we have identified four priorities for transnational outreach at the moment. Uh, one is will be tourism, the other one maritime spatial planning, sustainable development goals, and migration. And we are now discussing with our new partner uh, in the business the, um, uh, the range of activities that will be uh, implemented, and uh, you will also hear more about that. Uh, we will publish um, the information one, once it is agreed with our stakeholders, <laughs> we'll publish it on, on the website. Uh, one new thing for the next year that uh, I already mentioned in my opening speech yesterday will be the support scheme for uh, young researchers, or in principle we are speaking about uh, PhD uh, students uh, here. And this is a support scheme that will give an opportunity for us to engage our researchers more in uh, using the results of ESPON, uh, of ESPON research. Uh, and we will uh, support them financially, uh, their activities that would aim at preparing some articles uh, on the basis of ESPON evidence and publish them in the scientific journals or attend uh, certain scientific uh, events uh, and again present uh, ESPON uh, evidence. So there will be an open invitation uh, to PhD students uh, to apply uh, for this support. We will publish it at the beginning of next year, and we will, of course, advertise it also uh, very um, openly and publicly. And uh, here I would like to also invite uh, our colleagues uh, working in the universities also to support the dissemination of this uh, open call. So once 
uh, once we will publish it, we will definitely also share this information with you and we will be very happy if you could uh, spread the news and also encourage uh, the young researchers um, uh, to, uh, to apply for this. Uh, another another scheme, so to say, that we'll be uh, launching um, also to continue our cooperation with the media will uh, will be uh, um, a scheme to support our cooperation with uh, uh, the journalists. Uh, with uh, to basically, we are planning to contract uh, some media uh, services uh, that will also uh, further promote our outreach among wider public. So we'll be setting up several uh, contracts uh, with uh, media or media consortiums that can cover broad European audiences and that can offer us uh, the service in the format of uh, continuous articles uh, in the newspapers, in the magazines, again, uh, uh, capitalizing the results of, uh, of ESPON. There will be a range of publications that we're planning to prepare, as, as always, uh, in, in, the, in the framework of the next year. Uh, there will be uh, several of them related to uh, uh, green uh, infrastructure, uh, to, to green subjects, so to say, and this will be our priority for the first half of next year, and this is related to the priorities of the forthcoming Croatian presidency that we will be hearing uh, in a moment. So we'll be preparing a policy brief on green infrastructure in the urban areas, on the reuse of buildings and spaces in terms of transition to a circular economy, then there will be one on maritime spatial planning, and then uh, other, the other set will be more related to entrepreneurship, quality of life, and demographic uh, transformations in European uh, regions. And uh, finally, our next seminar is uh, planned uh, in uh, Zadar during the Croatian uh, presidency. And there we will uh, contribute, as I mentioned, to the strategic goal on green Croatia. And of course, further, we will be with our evidence facilitating the intergovernmental discussion towards the renewed uh, territorial agenda post 2020. Finally, finally, uh, I invite you all to contribute to our annual survey, uh, which is now uh, open. And we would very much appreciate to get your feedback on the usefulness of our work. Uh, on the possibilities to improve it uh, in the future. We use this as uh, an input, as an important uh, evidence for us to uh, also assess uh, the result and impact of our activities. Uh, and all this feeds also in the following work program of ESPON, in every following work program that we design uh, for every uh, next year. Uh, and this is why your voice is very important for us, so please uh, fill in uh, the survey. This will not take um, more than uh, seven and a half minutes. <laughs> if it is more, please let me know. We will redesign it for the next year. Uh, so you are very welcome. Uh, if there is any other way how you would like to uh, send us, communicate to us your feedback, please use that. Uh, you can always also talk to me, uh, send me an email, call me and tell me what you think about our work and we will be happy to adjust to your needs. So thank you very much so far. Good day to everyone. Uh, I work for uh, Ministry of Construction and Physical Planning uh, for of the Republic of Croatia, and I am also uh, the MC member of the. Oops. MC member, uh, Espon MC member, and I would just uh, like to tell you how my relationship with Espon uh, started. Uh, so one day my uh, superiors told me that I will uh, be um, like a second nominee or a substitute member in the ESPON monitoring committee. And I didn't know what uh, ESPON is, <laughs> so I was against it. But they told me that that is a just uh, formality because we have like real ESPON MC member. And I will continue with my daily job, and that is uh, physical planning. And uh, suddenly, my colleague withdrew from her position, 
and of, of, of within the ministry and also from the Aspen Monitoring Committee. And so <laughs> uh, I started to learn about Aspen. And yes, uh, I'm very glad that I can announce the Croatian presidency of the uh, Council of the European Union uh, in the first half of the 2020. Uh, this is the first time that uh, Croatia is uh, having a presidency, as you may know, and uh, this will be a very challenging uh, period for, uh, for us. So, our motto is a strong Europe in a world of uh, challenges. Uh, the Croatian presidency comes at a time of a great change for the European Union. Uh, at the beginning of a new institutional and legislative cycle following the formation of a new composition of European institutions, as well as the challenges of the process of withdrawing the United Kingdom from the European Union. And there or, therefore, we think that only strong and united Europe can face those challenges. Uh, priorities of uh, our presidency program are uh, for we have four main areas, uh, Europe that develops, yeah. Europe that connects, uh, Europe that protects, and the global influential Europe. Uh, in our work, Croatian presidency will also take into account the priorities and the working program of the new European Commission. Uh, the first area, and that is uh, Europe that develops, uh, is directly linked with the EU cohesion policy and promotes balanced and sustainable development of the Union and its member states. Uh, European Union is facing new global challenges and demographic changes, further development of policies that create better working and living conditions are necessary for ensuring the quality of life, uh, taking into account environmental protection issues and fight against climate change. Uh, therefore, Croatian Presidency will strive for a balanced, sustainable and inclusive development of the Union that respects the specificities and needs of all member states, their regions and its citizens. Uh, the specific topics of our presidency are green infrastructure, uh, uh, green infrastructure in urban areas and reuse of buildings and spaces in terms of transition to a circular economy. Uh, we, uh, our topics are aligned with the proposal uh, for a regulation of the European Parliament and the Council of the European Regional Development <coughs> Fund and Cohesion Fund and the policy objective two and that is a green, greener, low carbon Europe by promoting clean and fair energy transition, green and blue investment, the circular economy, climate adaptation and risk prevention and management. Uh, we are preparing a few documents which will feed the discussion uh, about these topics. Uh, we will have two policy brief. Uh, Aspen EGPC will support us uh, with the policy brief on green infrastructure in urban areas and also with the policy brief on reuse of buildings and spaces. Uh, and on the national level, we are preparing a urban green infrastructure development program and the circular management of buildings and space development program. These programs uh, will be adopted by uh, our government uh, during the presidency. Uh, we expect uh, them to be adopted in, uh, in February. Uh, regarding the territorial and urban matters, uh, in our building block, uh, we have to, uh, we have, you know, rather uh, uh, complicated, I, I would say, or maybe a challenging task. Uh, we have to, uh, this is implementation building block, and we have to contrib contribute to the implementation of the territorial agenda in a way to uh, draft the implementation mechanisms uh, to prepare a list of pilot actions and a communication action plan. Uh, regarding the urban matters, we have to support the successful implementation of the urban agenda. Uh, we, will we will work on uh, clustering the actions from, from the partnerships and also we will prepare the path uh, for adoption of the Leipzig Charter, new Leipzig Charter. 
Uh, this is our agenda for meetings. We have this block of territorial cohesion and urban matters meeting. Uh, NTCCP and UDG we planned for uh, end of February. And the uh, DG level meetings uh, are, are uh, planned for uh, end of April. Uh, between that, we will have task forces and preparatory group in January and March, and they will take place in Zagreb. We will have Urbact MC meeting in Dubrovnik on 13th and 14th of May. And ESPON week will take place in Zadar, uh, last week of May. Oh, I just skipped. Uh, so, uh, city of Zadar uh, is uh, situated on the, our coastal line, on somewhere on the middle. It has a population of 75,000 citizens. It is the fifth largest city in, uh, in Croatia. It is a historical and cultural uh, and touristic center of North Dalmatia. It is very well known. Uh, you can uh, reach Zadar uh, by plane because Zadar has its airport. Uh, and um, regarding the Espon Week, we uh, already know that we will have Espon MC meeting uh, and ECP meeting in Duke's Palace. Uh, Duke Palace is situated on, on the Zadar Peninsula, and it is reconstructed. Um, and uh, but for the Espon seminar, we don't know yet. But uh, public pr procurement is in progress, so uh, let's hope that everything will be ready uh, till soon. Let's say. Okay. So I'm looking forward to welcome you all in Croatia. Thank you. Okay, next second half of 2020, the German presidency um, will be established and we are not that far in the elaboration of the program yet because we have, we have half a year more time. Um, but I think the main um, milestones and, and events has already prepared and related to the, to the, um, to the meetings, um, which has will are foreseen, we have already planned starting with the, on the 1st of July, tentatively 19th of August in Bonn, with a task force concerning the renewal of the territorial agenda. This is in the main, um, ta the main objective actually um, during the presidency to, to the, the territorial agenda. We have a meeting of the NTCCP network in September in Berlin and the meeting of the Director General Territorial Cohesion in October in Berlin. And then we have, um, I think, a, a, long, a lot of years we, there has been no informal meeting of the ministers responsible for territorial development or urban um, development. And we have, it is just a kind of an old tradition in the meantime that we have an informal meeting um, of the ministers responsible on the, on the 30th of November um, taking place in Leipzig, which is also a tradition because 12 years ago there has been the territorial agenda adopted in Leipzig and the Leipzig Charta is named after the city it has been adopted. Related to the Espon week, uh, to Espon, um, there is not that much to say yet. Uh, the date is fixed, the week is fixed between 16th and 20th of November. And there are strong signs that it will not take place in the former capital, it will be taken maybe in the actual capital, of, of in, um, but it is not yet that far um, certified. Related to the topics, this is for sure uh, the territorial agenda 2020 plus will be in the main concern related to the territorial perspective and to the urban um, development, it is the, the renewal of the Leipzig Charter is already in the progress. And I think it is, will be a, a big um, honor for the German presidency 
to, to bring all these discussions, all these activities, all this pain maybe also included to the end and, and finally to the adoption of the, of, the new, of, the renew, of the new territorial agenda. And I think this would be a great progress to, uh, to have. But um, also we intend to launch pilot projects related to the implementation of the, of the territorial agenda to keep the territorial agenda alive after the adoption. And this is related to the, to the, um, to the priorities of the agenda. Uh, I think we are thinking of having transnational activity groups dealing with the questions related um, of, the, of the priorities of the territorial agenda and how to implement it in daily work and also in the national uh, perspectives. I think this is it for the moment. And we have one half year, half year time to further elaborate on this subject actually. Thank you. Excellencies, dear ambassadors of ESPON, I am here on behalf of the Finnish Presidency to give a few words for the closing of the, these wonderful two days. And um, I've personally really enjoyed and would like to share some of the highlights I would like to point out on these two days. We started off yesterday very strongly. Uh, Ilona stated we have a new ESPON ahead of us and I really like this mentioning of the pile of gold that we sit on. Indeed we have a mountainous pile of gold. Um, information is considered the new oil of this century and it relates to gold very strongly. Now we start distributing this gold. The wealth of knowledge and disseminating it and the need to share it has been mentioned in many speakers and it, it is really important. Ever than before, with the times of misinformation and um, fiction gaining ground from facts. Concerning these problems we face with facts versus fiction, I'm really glad Ilona chose to take this approach to invite two journalists to these two days. I would like to thank Terry and Samuel for their wonderful work. Working with journalists is wonderful, especially when you meet someone as esteemed and professional as these two people. But the wonderful thing about journalists also is that they force us to communicate in an understandable manner, get down from our own silos and, and high level thinking that does not relate to the common people. And they also ask the tricky questions that we actually have to answer, but oftentimes we do not want to necessarily answer or want to keep ourselves speaking in vague terms so that we don't have to face difficult questions. And what third thing wonderful about journalists is that they keep on our, ourselves in check also on edge that um, if we say something that is scandalous, we will be sure it will be in the news in two minutes and cause a massive Twitter storm or else. Uh, of course, that's not only a negative thing if we cause the Twitter storm because uh, well, it appears no one did this, but um, that way would have actually got Espon on the map and Helsinki on the map very strongly and reached out to the world out of our Espon bubble. So Ilona, thanks for this. Uh, it was a good choice to have these journalists aboard. And um, other things mentioned frequently co-creation, cooperation, collaboration. We need more of that. And, and as before I said, we need more of the um, use of knowledge and distribution of knowledge and, and doing more 
with the less uh, resources we have available. Now, thinking about this, we always want to strive to do more than we actually do. It's in human nature and uh, how to progress Europe is the only way to do more with less. However, we should be merciful to ourselves concerning this because it's not easy. We, we live in a world where information flows constantly, flood us via email or social media, attention grabbers. They really change our work and life into this small task, running, keep running faster type of work. And we may lose sight of the bigger things that are more important, the more strategi strategic long-term things we have to achieve. We have a great vision for the future of Europe. Let's keep that in mind and focus our attention on the actions needed for that and try to focus not to do everything reactionary, but more proactionary. Speaking of co-creation, cooperation, multi-level governance, cross-sector cooperation, these two days were wonderfully uh, handled, tackled uh, our, our two main strands uh, in, in territorial cooperation and urban development the territorial agenda, of course, and the urban agenda on the, on the second day. And ESPON really has a future uh, in, in these two agendas. And, and today, these two days were, were wonderful to highlight the possibilities of ESPON. It is in the Finnish presidency's interest to promote this idea that ESPON can, can assist in these two processes. The territorial agenda and the urban agenda. The second major issue of the Finnish presidency is, is digitalization. And it was very well stated yesterday that when it comes to digitalization, we need a human-centric approach. And we also need Concerning knowledge and data, we need data harmonization and interoperability and open data systems. And these are key to gain the necessary uh, keys to, to achieving the, the better vision for Europe. And Europe can be the third way in the world concerning digitalization, apart from the US and China. One single highlight still I would like to mention that these two days have provided is uh, I asked Timo what was the highlight of these two days and he mentioned, well, yesterday's dinner. Uh, but of course he mentioned many other things as well. <laughs> but but yes, <laughs> well, yesterday's dinner, I have to say myself, uh, I'm really glad we organized it and it was full of fire, smoke, and warm drinks, but most importantly, it was full of warm hearts. And yesterday we, we saw what the Espan family is about, and I'm really proud to be a part of this family, and would like to be so also in the future. With this, I would like to thank you all for coming to Helsinki, and also the viewers online, to giving your time, that is short, on these very important issues and this European program we have. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, so we have uh, reached the end of the program of this one and a half days. I very much hope that uh, you enjoyed it. Um, we were there for you to uh, bring the best of ESPON that we have uh, accumulated so far. And I hope you have plenty of uh, insights, interesting evidence, ideas to bring back home. 
Moreover, I hope that uh, when you go back home, you will uh, leave this place with the feeling that uh, now I am the ambassador of ESPON and I have a responsibility to communicate uh, ESPON evidence and messages to my colleagues, my friends, everybody who is interested to uh, make um, Europe an even better place to uh, live and work. Um, and I would like to thank very much everybody who uh, was involved in the preparation and the implementation of the program uh, for these days. I would like to start with uh, the Finnish presidency. Uh, my colleagues were telling me that it was indeed a true pleasure to cooperate uh, with the colleagues of the Finnish presidency in the course of the preparation of this seminar. And I really very much hope also that you uh, enjoyed both the the premises and also the hospitality of, of our Finnish colleagues. I'm very sorry uh, personally that I had to miss the dinner last night because of my not very good health condition at the moment. <laughs> but um, I'm very happy to hear that uh, you all enjoyed it, that it was uh, an, a very exciting experience for all of you. Um, I would also like to thank uh, everybody who was uh, involved actively in the program as a speaker, as a panelist, uh, and for all of your contributions and uh, insights and for trying also to make ESPON a better program uh, in the current programming period. And uh, finally, of course, I would like to uh, thank uh, my colleagues uh, of the ESPON EGTC and two of them in particular, Martin and Michaela. Uh, Martin was the coordinator for the preparation of the program. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martin, for all your efforts. I saw you working day and night and everybody else did as well uh, to make sure that uh, everything is uh, perfectly in order and we can enjoy uh, these days. And also thank you for the policy brief on the digitalization of uh, uh, digital, what was it, digital urban environments, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, to Michaela for the effort in preparing the State of the EU Territory Report. This is, as I mentioned, our a major publication, second major publication of this programming period. It is related very closely to the topics of the future cohesion policy to the priorities of the fu future cohesion policy and we will use this publication as a basis for many of our following outreach activities that we are planning uh, to implement um, next year because as you know the process of uh, and the discussion on the future of cohesion policy is ongoing will be ongoing all the programming activities will be ongoing and ESPON is there for you, will be there for you, so if you're also interested specifically in any kind of support in relation to the future uh, programming, uh, please do let us know. We have many different opportunities and formats uh, to communicate uh, our evidence to us, uh, indirectly, directly, through also different workshops, uh, through uh, specific extracts of our evidence that uh, you need specifically to support post-2020 programming. So please do use us, our resources, our capacities, our uh, evidence. Uh, we are there for you. Is there anything else that I didn't say, colleagues? No? Okay. Then um, thank you again. I hope you enjoyed these two days. And uh, now it's time to have lunch. And then for the European contact points, your next meeting starts at 2 o'clock. 2.30, sorry, 2.30. And then uh, the EGTC, and this will be led by the managing authority. And then uh, uh, our partners meeting with our research uh, colleagues uh, will also start at 2.30, also in different premises. So we are looking forward to meeting you there. So. Please enjoy the afternoon, enjoy Helsinki, and uh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>